Here. Mr. Burke? Here. Mrs. Costa? Here. Mrs. Kapiskus? Here. Mr. LeClaire? Here. Okay. Uh, I will now accept. Uh, yes. I will now accept nominations for chairperson of the Winsocket School Committee. Are there any further? Are there any nominations? I nominate Mr. Paul Berger. Can you accept? Second. Second. I, I, I accept. Um, I, I declare nominations. No, you have to ask if there are any other candidates. Uh, are there any other candidates? Are there any other nominations? Okay. Okay. Hearing none, I declare the nominations closed. Uh, roll call to approve Paul Bourget as the chair chairman of the Woonsocket School Committee. Uh, Mr. Bourget? Yes. Mr. Burke? Yes. Ms. Costa? Yes. Mrs. Kapiskus? Yes. Mr. LeClaire? Yes. Due to my voice issue today, I will just handle this next item and then we will I'll, I'll have the vice chair continue with the meeting. I make a motion to nominate for vice chairman Donald G. Burke. Second. Second. Are there any other nominations? I declare the nominations for vice chair closed. Dr. McGee, roll call. Chairman Bourget? Yes. Mr. Burke? Yes. Mrs. Kapiskus? Yes. Mrs. Costa? Of course. Mr. LeClaire? Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, why don't we stand for a moment of silence and the pledge, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag, the flag of, of the United, United States, States of America, America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, with, with liberty and justice for all. Do you want to take it over, Don? Sure, sure. You know, the, uh, the word vice is sometimes seen as an opposite to virtue, but vice also means in place of. Mm -hmm. So tonight I will be the voice in place of Mr. Bouget. <laughs> Thank God. Second that. <laughs> <laughs> Are we sure we don't want Ms. Kapiskis to do it? The ghost of Christmas <laughs> present speaks. The only difference is Mr. Bouget speaks with a, a French Woonsocket accent, <laughs> and and I unfortunately speak with a Irish Catholic Boston accent. So. Okay, enough said. Uh, our first item on the agenda is our good and welfare, and tonight we have Glow Park Elementary School, which is making a, a presentation. Um, Michelle Kennel, Glow Park principal, uh, will go first. Um, and then we will move to public comment <coughs> if necessary. I would like to first apologize. It was pajama day at school, so you're lucky I went home and put clothes on. <laughs> <laughs> so what I um, prepared today for a presentation is the district has spent um, a lot of resources and time around academic teaming and the idea of collaboration in every classroom with students problem solving. So I spent some time in one of my self-contained classrooms, one of my intermediate self-contained classrooms, and I have a video of snippets of the progression of the lesson from front-loading vocabulary to the debrief at the end about what you liked and what you didn't like. Um, so you're gonna see all the little steps along the way, and I hope you like what you see. Um, a couple of the kiddos, you know, um, will struggle when they speak. I left them in there because they really, they just prove that you set a high standard, they'll meet it. And I was very proud of their performance. So I hope you enjoy. Yeah, I don't know if you're going to watch it here, if you're going to watch it here. Well, we have to go down. I'm not sure. We'll come down. So we'll move down. Yep. Can you see it all? I'll be fine. No, it's on the. <laughs> It was on there, yeah. After you said. I don't know how to lower it or I would. Okay. Thank you. 
engineering. How it's going to scan going across, right? Because yeah. remember, I said it has to go between two desks. So this middle part can that be heavy? Why not, Mateo? What's going to happen if my middle is heavy? What's going to What's going to happen to the bridge? Right, because when he goes walking across it, if the middle's too heavy, it's gonna fall down and bring it to the river. Right, so when you're engineering, like that word. That's what your guys are engineers today. When you're engineering your bridge, okay, think about it. Imagine if a car was driving across it, okay, and if it's too heavy in one spot, it's gonna break when then something goes over it. So you gotta think, you gotta put just the right amount of stuff in order to be able to get across. Oh, yes, and plus and plus and plus. There's a little bit more. Right, so when you're engineering, how do you know that word? That's what you're doing when you're high school engineers. What are you learning today? We are learning problem solving. How to solve the problem. Sorry, I just hit loops so we won't have to click between them. Ready. What are you learning today? We are learning problem solving. How to solve the problem. Solve the problem. To solve the problem? Yeah, you told me. A minute ago, say it again. We were doing we this, right? So we said we changed it, and we just started doing this. What was your original idea? This what was it? What did you, what did you change about that idea? I changed about it because that seems to be too much. Okay, so a lot of Ready. What are you Well, this 
she's like, oh no, what's gonna happen? Oh, 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 did not so now they're meeting back to ask what they liked or what they noticed about others in comparison to their own okay. right, so guys, let's take a look at our engineering that we did today okay when we're looking at these structures okay Raising your hand, what worked and what didn't we work? What worked for your project? What worked for somebody else's project that you noticed? Giovanni? The one next to ours. These two? Okay. I like how they might be the same thing as us, but they put levels on the bottom. So there you have one of our intermediate self contains moving through the entire process of what we envision, you know, good teaching practice. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. go like the wizard of oz what's behind the screen mm -hmm. what shall appear very good thank you miss canal for the presentation and it's good to see the students Building bridges amongst each other. What a nice idea. Uh, at this moment now, we're going to move to public comment, public good and welfare comment. If anyone would like to speak to the school committee here, please um, come to the podium, give us your name and address. I ask you to stay um, uh, within the quorum and also no more than five minutes. I promise it won't be more than five minutes. Donna Coderre, I'm the principal at Leo Savoy Elementary School, 990 Menden Road, one socket. I just wanted to thank a few people publicly. I don't know if any, if everyone's aware, but we had uh, six families affected by a fire at Rock Ridge last week or two weeks ago now. And I just want to publicly thank um, Allison Boule from the high school and Local 1137, Good Shepherd Catholic Schools, and North Smithville Elementary School, who all reached out to me the same day to make donations and start planning to provide help to the families. 
Uh, of course, many of the staff and um, families at our local elementary schools have also called. Um, some of our families can't get in yet, so we don't have any place to put anything. So I told them to hold off till after the holidays, but uh, we were able to give them gift cards and food and immediate necessities. And then after the holidays, a lot of them uh, need new bedroom sets because the second floor on most of the apartments, if they weren't burnt out, they were, um, they were I don't know what you call it, watered out water damage um so um i just really wanted to publicly think because it's a tough time of year to have something like that it's a tough time for it ever to happen but especially during the holidays so that's all thank you thank you anyone else like to uh to speak public good and welfare okay seeing none hearing none Okay, now, if you noticed on the agenda, we have a special um, celebration right now. In honor of the holidays that we uh, will be celebrating this weekend, and the holidays that are being celebrated this weekend, and also the vacation that shall begin for our students tomorrow and our faculty tomorrow. Um, Woonsocket Area Career and Technical Center has worked overtime for us today. And uh, we're going to have a little five-minute recess to um, enjoy some treats. Um, I didn't, I didn't. They, when I came in, the, the treats were covered by a blanket, so I don't know what they are, but it'll be a nice surprise to find out. <laughs> so, so we will take a recess. Uh, make a motion. Uh, take a motion. Uh, motion is made by Mr. Bourget. Second. Second by Mr. Leclerc and Mrs. Costa. Um, at uh, 719, do we need a, um, a vote? Okay, roll call. Chairman Bourget? Yes. Vice Chair Burke? Yes. Mrs. Kapiskis? Yes. Mrs. Costa? Yes. Mr. LeClaire? Yes. Okay, we will take a five minute recess. <laughs> Generally, it's more than five minutes. But... That's the nice. I did my job. <laughs> Good job. Okay, not bad. Excellent. Bring you something? You no.
Motion to come. What is that dressing? That dressing is good. All right. Okay, thank you, um, students and Chef Paul, for a, a great little treat. Great um, job. I hope you all now enjoy your, your, your winter vacation that begins tomorrow. Um, I'm going to make a motion out to come out of recess at 7.31. Second. Second. Motion made and second by Chairman Boger and Ms. Costa. Uh, roll call vote, Dr. McGee. Chairman Bourget? Yes. Vice Chair Burke? Yes. Mrs. Kapiskus? Yes. Mrs. Costa? Yes. Mr. LeClaire? Yes. Thank you. And we're back into the meeting. And my apologies to Dave Richards for the uh, 10 minutes of uh, dead air time that he has told me happens when we have these recesses. So, okay. Um, Motion uh, for recognitions and announcements now for the superintendent. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. So I want to start by recognizing the wonderful Globe Park students that we saw on the video, um, as well as uh, their teacher and Mrs. Kennel, the principal of Globe Park. It, it's just an example that we saw, a great example this evening of students problem solving and thinking critically in their classes. And that kind of work is, uh, is, is typical of what you see across the district in our classrooms. So I wanna thank them for doing a wonderful job in representing Globe Park Elementary School. I, I secondly wanna thank, uh, and, and they're, they're here, you just recognize them, uh, Vice Chair Burke, the incredible Woonsocket Area Career and Technical Center culinary students. Um, I'd like to give them another round, another round of applause. <laughs> and I'd like to recognize Chef Paul uh, who's in the back there with them as well. Great job, Chef. Great job, uh, students. Um, really excited. As everybody knows, we have an, an amazing culinary program at the Winsocket Area Career and Technical Center. And I'm really excited. I'm, I'm going to kind of announce it before it's officially announced. But we, we just found out yesterday that uh, the uh, Career Center is one of 13 uh, career centers and CTE programs across the state. They're going to be receiving $125,000. Uh, through the Department of Education for a food truck. So uh, we're going to be starting that process. Yes, let's give it a round of applause. So this this amazing food that we're able to, uh, to eat this evening is, is going to be trucking around the city and trucking around the state uh, for, for, for a long time. Um, so we're really excited about that. We're excited to work with um, with our amazing students, not just our culinary students, um, but we have students in other programs at the Career Center that'll be a part of this process as well. So, cause we're gonna be having our automotive students, they'll be, you know, working on the, uh, on the food truck when necessary. We have our graphics program, which will be working uh, on the design of the truck. Um, we have our, our digital media and P-Tech students that can potentially create menu apps for, for our, uh, our food truck. So we're really excited about this opportunity. And shortly after the first of the year, I'll be announcing it uh, public uh, formally um, as RIDE gets a little bit more details out to the, uh, to the community. So again, really excited about that. So thank you to those amazing students and the, and the wonderful cuisine that they, um, that they put together for us. Um, next, I want to announce, I'm pleased to introduce, although she was unable to make it this evening, uh, Ms. Karen Cahill as a new principal for Kevin K. Coleman Elementary School. Ms. Cahill joins us with over 35 years of experience, 12 of those as an urban elementary principal. Most recently, she worked as an elementary principal for the Boston Public Schools. Yeah, you'll, you'll appreciate that, Mr. Mr. Yes, Burke. Yeah, very good. Bring the Boston person in. Um, while working at the Boston Public Schools, she served as a teacher, curriculum coach, assistant principal, and director of recruitment. She earned her master's degree in education administration from Framingham State College <laughs> and her bachelor's degree in elementary and special education from Eastern New Mexico University, where she also learned and was able to, pr to practice speaking Spanish daily. Um, as an administrator, she found her passion in life working with diverse urban schools. She believes in finding the success and well-being of each student and working hard to reflect student achievement at every school she has led. Based on her record of accomplishments, I highly recommend Ms. Karen Cahill for the position of principal at Coleman Elementary School. That's great. And unfortunately, she couldn't be here this evening, but she will be starting uh, when we come back from our um, our. Um, 
break. holiday break. Awesome. So <laughs> yes, break. <clears throat> Um, Tasting the food over there, huh? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, the Winsocket High School holiday concert was held on December 8th. I want to recognize uh, our wonderful high school musicians, the concert band, jazz band, chorus, and the drum line. I know uh, some of us here um, were in attendance, and uh, the, the high school music department uh, once again right. did not disappoint. It was a wonderful performance, so I want to thank uh, those those musicians at Winsocket High School. The Main Street Holiday Stroll was held on December 15th. Um, seven elementary schools and our middle schools decorated trees there. And um, I think Mrs. Coder is sitting out, out in the audience. Congratulations to Mrs. Coder and Savoy on uh, winning the tree decorating contest. Yeah, woo! Is that two years in a row? Is that two years in a row, Donna? It is, well, it's, it's, it's turning into a dynasty. So. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. Um, uh, lastly, Winsocket High School student athlete, sophomore Dylan Calori, who is an offensive guard and defensive tackle for the Winsocket High School football team, will play against some of the nation's top high school players in the annual All American Bowl on December 22nd awesome. at AT&T Stadium, which is the home of the NFL's Dallas Cowboys in Texas. That is awesome. He was selected for the All-American Bowl while attending the Bryant University football camp this past summer. He will take part in a four-day event that includes on-field training sessions, recruiting seminars, position leadership training, and the bowl game. In the classroom, Dylan is a high honors student who takes advanced placement classes and currently owns a 4.3 GPA. We are all so proud of Dylan and look forward to hearing more about his success at the All-American Bowl. Congratulations, Dylan, and good luck to you. Good luck. Amazing. That is power right there. And lastly, I would just want to wish everyone a very happy holiday season, a very safe and restful vacation. Uh, today was our last day of school. Tomorrow's the first day of vacation. We will return to classes on Tuesday, January 3rd. So again, I want to wish everyone out there, all of our students and their families and our teachers and staff and administrators, a very happy holiday season. Uh, with that, Mr. Vice Chair, that concludes my announcements and recognitions. Okay, thank you, Dr. McGee. I, I do have two comments I'd like to make before we move on. First of all, as we name a new principal for the Coleman School, um, don't you, should, shouldn't you thank the young man who has been I, holding the fort? You know, that's true. Yes, for most of this year, and yes. who oftentimes holds the fort at many, many schools for us as an acting principal. That's you are Please. correct. Yeah, Mr. Richard Zagrodny, Dick Zagrodny, who is uh, he's saved us a lot over the years. <laughs> and when I say saved us, he, he's he's come in to serve as interim acting principal, assistant principal, you name it. And uh, Dick is a former educator. Of, of more than 30 years here in the Woonsocket Education Department. I had the, the pleasure of starting my career working with him uh, in Fairmount, you know, 34 years ago. And he is a wonderful uh, educator. He's a wonderful administrator, but most importantly, he's a wonderful person. And I want to thank him for continuing to, uh, to, to provide support to our students and our staff and our families here in Woonsocket, even as um, a retired educator. So thank you, Dick. Um, and we look forward to continue working with you in the future, which we probably will. So, but yes, Mr. Burke, thank you for uh, for for saying that. I know I feel so bad. Maybe the maybe he can finally retire. You know? Yes. <laughs> also, um, my wife and I attended the Main Street Holiday Stroll, and we enjoyed the uh, the Christmas trees from the students. But also, um, we got to hear the many many singing voices of the Villanovan. Mm -hmm. um, chorus that that sang at the stroll too. So, so that was very good to see that from from the middle school, the Villanovan school. So very good. <clears throat> I'd like to make a motion now to receive and place on file the superintendent's recognitions and announcements. Mr. Burke. I'm sorry. Before I make that motion, would anyone like to say something about the superintendent's comments? Yes, I just want to um, piggyback kind of off of our uh, wonderful students that made us our delicious snacks. Um, I attended a, wedi a wedding recently, and I just want to say the food wasn't even as good as we just ate here. So uh, hats off to you guys back there. You guys did your thing, and uh, I appreciate it. I look forward to uh, eating more snacks from you guys soon. <laughs> um, also, uh, my wife and kids also attended the holiday stroll 
It was a beautiful site. Um, there was a lot of good things there. And uh, yes, Miss Cordia, your tree was beautiful. Um, thanks to you and your students and everybody else that participated. It was wonderful. Um, and I just wanted to continue Very saying good. that. Thank, Thank you. you. Ms. Costa. Anyone else would like to say anything? Okay. Now, I will make a motion to receive and place <clears throat> on file the superintendent's recognition and announcements. Is there a second? Second. second. I didn't hear that. What was it? <laughs> okay. Second by Chairman Boje. I had to do that once. Um, all those in Wait. favor, say by, uh, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. We will now move on to the approval of minutes. First of all, um, motion to approve the November 16th, 2022 closed meeting minutes. I'll make the motion. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Costa. Are there any corrections? Anyone sees with the minutes? Okay. Uh, roll call, Dr. McGee. Chairman Bourget. Yes. Vice Chair Burke. Yes. Mrs. Kapiskis. Yes. Mrs. Costa. Yes. Mr. LeClaire. Yes. I would like to make a motion now to approve the November 16th, 2022 open meeting minutes. I'll make the motion. Do a second. Second. Second by Mrs. Costa. Again, any corrections need to be made? Okay, good good job, Ms. Blaze. All right, roll call vote, Dr. McGee. Chairman Bourget. Yes. Vice Chair Burke. Yes. Mrs. Kapiskis. Yes. Mrs. Costa. Yes. Mr. LeClaire. Yes. I will make a motion now to discuss and approve um, <clears throat> the consent agenda. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Chairman Bourget. Um, is there any school committee member who would like to take any item from the consent agenda out of order? Nope, seeing none. Um, I will now. I will now ask for a roll call. Chairman McGee. Chairman Bourget. Yes. Vice Chair Burke. Yes. Mrs. Kapiskis. Yes. Mrs. Costa. Yes. Mr. Leclerc. Yes. Okie dokie. Okay, moving on now to communications. We have an interesting presentation um, uh, of two schools. Uh, there'll be a presentation on attendance and anti-bullying plans and activities by Leo Savoy and Vernon Heights Elementary Schools. Um, who's this? this uh, Mr. DeRosia will be first and then Ms. Kadira. Good afternoon, good evening, everyone. I'm Rob DeRosia, principal of Vernon Heights Elementary School. Um, thank you for having me and Merry Christmas to you all. And um, tonight I'm going to talk just quickly about the attendance. I got that little thing going on as well here. So I asked Mrs. Cody to, to step in for me as vice president, but she said no. <laughs> so we, um, it's really important for us. It's not, as I say, us, it's not, it's, it's um, always a team effort at Vernon. And um, when we, every Friday morning, we meet as a team, my two social workers and um, my behavioral specialists, and we talk about our attendance. We talk about any of the behaviors that are going around the building that we need to address. Um, it's, it's really important because what, what, I've, what I've done to make it more streamlined, I made a Google form that allows me, if you can see on page two of the worksheet I gave you, I just gave you that as a, as a snapshot. I can go within seconds to, into the Google form and see how many times Dr. McGee has been out of school, how many times he's acted up in school, where he's acted up in school, um, whether it's with the itinerants, it could be with um, at recess, at lunch, classroom. So I'm able to, to pinpoint and address that, address it right at that time. <clears throat> to me, that this seems to be the saving grace for us just because of the time. I don't have to go back to the office and say, okay, Mr. Burke, how many times, is, and I'm going through, trying to flip through and find out how many um, incidents he had <clears throat> for, for the week. But we do this every Friday morning. Um, so with that, the attendance, we, we do the same type of things. Um, we try to pinpoint who the kids are that are really in need of having um, 
uh, the phone call home or a letter home. We're, we're constantly, my social workers are amazing. Between me, Mrs. Kissenberth, and Mrs. Martineau, Mrs. Mrs. Uh, yeah, Martineau, we are constantly contacting families to see what we can do to help them. It's not always about like, I got you, come on, what's going on? We always try to find a root cause of what the problem is. Whether the kid doesn't want to come to school, there's got to be a why. We want to know the why. Um, it's really um, important to, to build that relationship with our families. So when we do call, it's not always, and we do call on a positive, hey, your, your son or your daughter's been coming to school, we're so proud of them. And so it, it, we keep that relationship going. Um, some of the things that we do, we, uh, we plan it out for the year. Uh, we have the perfect uh, attendance celebrations and we're, we're proactive and positive um, phone calls to our families. Um, and then, of course, the older the kid, we can have that conversation with our kids, like, what's going on? Why, how come you're not coming to school? Many, many times they'll come back and say, my, my, my parents won't get up or something. It's, an, it's all, because of my age of my, my students. It's a lot of time. It's, an, it's more of an adult. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll address that. And the bullying is we are a very, we try very hard to be a kind school. We've had a few walkthroughs this year, uh, learning walks. And one thing that it, it always surfaces is it's a very welcoming and kind environment for us, for our students, for our families, and anyone who, if you, if you walked in our building, you, you would feel the, the welcoming atmosphere around the building. Um, again, we, we try to plan it out for the year. Please forgive my, my voice. Um, we have a kindness club. We have a, a kindness tree as you walk into the, into the foyer. We have a kindness tree. If you get caught doing um, nice, kind things, you get a, a leaf, and we put it up on the tree. The kids love that. Um, we did the bullying prevention week. We did that back, um, I think that was in November. In November, we had that with, um, what was that person's name? Al, the respect guy. Um, he came in and did a great show. He did two great shows for us. Um, and again, going back to my social workers, we have what they call their lunch bunches. So the kids get to go in there and they get to sit around um, the table and have these conversations about bullying or attendance. A lot of things come out that. We, we can address. I mean, the biggest thing is communication and um, building relationships with our kids and families. So I'd welcome any one of you to come up on a Friday morning to sit with us and have that conversation around the table. It's really, it's really impressive how it, how it rolls out. So. Very good, good. Well, thank you, thank you so much. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. So my, again, my name's Donna Coderre and I am the principal at Leo Savoy. Uh, I think Rob hit it really on the head when he talks about relationships, because I think a benefit I have, and, and so does Rob, is that we've been here for a while, so we know our families very well. We know their siblings that are graduating from high school, we know them. I mean, 11 years in one school, I've had a lot of times the whole family come through. So I kind of recognize right away when something's going on with the family. So that's very helpful. Um, I shared my, I'm not gonna go through everything cause it's four days before Christmas and I'm sure you've heard a lot about attendance, but um, we kind of set attendance up month by month. It's something that uh, we've worked with Dr. McGee on where same thing with bullying. We kind of have like a, a timeline that we follow. So like in the summertime, I will review what attendance records looked like in the past and I'll try and make sure that I'm really watching those red flags when we open school at our open house, when we send our open house letters home, when we send our newsletters home every month, when I send messages out, we always try to talk about the importance of attendance. We can't teach them if they're not in front of us. Um, and despite our best efforts, we still have those families that, you know, through COVID, school became, <laughs> 
arbitrary almost. You know, we, we, we beg them to send them and then we have to send them home or quarantine their classroom. And parents were frustrated and we were frustrated. But what happens if we don't have the kids coming to school on a regular basis in elementary school is they think school is optional. And as they get older, they give their parents a more difficult time to go. And then it is optional. And then we're constantly chasing them. We're always trying to come up with new and creative ways to get kids in school and keep them there. And that's by having um, school be not just a place where they learn, but a place where they feel safe, <clears throat> a place where fun things. We had the best day ever today with our chorus and our dance club and our music teacher. And, and the kids that came had one of the best days. They left you know, on cloud nine. They were all happy. Um, but it, it is really difficult. We do attendance awards. We call parents. I used to send letters pretty regularly, but I don't find that works for us as much. A uh, personal phone call. A letter seems a little more intimidating or a little easier to dismiss than an actual phone call. And it all comes down to, hey, you know, how can I help? Not like Rob said, I got you. So we do all those things. Uh, we just gave out for the first trimester over 100 certificates of either perfect attendance or excellent attendance. Because some kids, you know, they do get sick and they only missed one day. Or, and we want to recognize that because that's still good attendance. You know, it's still very good. It might not be perfect, but it's excellent. We take every opportunity to recognize, uh, you know, what them showing up. So when when you have when you're bored, you can look at um, my timeline of attendance. Uh, we also meet with our SEL, our social worker, our school psychologist, and our behavior interventionist every other Friday morning, and we go over kids at risk. I have a big board in my office, and I have it all coded based on discipline based on attendance, based on academics. So I can look at that board quickly. And I can see, and I'll tell you what, most of the kids who are struggling academically also have a, a symbol next to their name that says they don't come to school enough. So it, it correlates, you know, and I don't think it's ever going to be an easy, um, an easy thing to address. Uh, it is better. It is better since we're back in school full time. Um, and all we can do is keep plugging along when it comes to that. So it's really hard to hold elementary students accountable when we know they can't get there unless their parents are a part of that solution. So, and anytime, if you come up with any other suggestions that we can use, you know, we really do try to um, go out of the way to recognize kids who come to school, among other things. Um, Dr. Uh, we all get um, attendant works attendance works and we get suggestions um, through them. Dr. McGee shares it with us. And every once in a while, I'll print one of their newsletters and send it out if it has new information or something that I think will catch a parent's eye. So, and then just like um, if a student is having trouble academically, we have tiers for attendance and um, we use different interventions for attendance too. So I'm gonna go on to bullying. And just like attendance, we have um, we've we've done a lot of work with bullying. When the kids came back to school from COVID, they really last year was. If I had another year like last year, I might retire early because it was a tough year. Kids did not get along with each other. They were not patient with each other. They were not kind to each other because they had been living in isolation, and it was all about them. And they really wanted no part with uh, no. They wanted nothing to do with um, making adjustments or <laughs> anything. And it was a lot of work. And so this year we came prepared in case it happened again. And it's been a great year. But we always start the year with our anti-bullying um, pledge. Every every child has to sign it. Um, and the first six weeks of school, I'm gonna be honest with you, it, I don't know if you're gonna like this or not, but I don't focus on academics as much as routines and systems and making sure that the school is safe and the kids know what the expectations are, whether it's in the classroom, in the library, in the gym, at recess, 
and we go over and over and over to make sure that they know what the expectations are. It makes for a much smoother school year. So um, we also had Al the raw guy. We had uh, we do second step. We've already do, we've already been doing it right along. Our phys ed and social worker do that um, weekly to start the school year. We are a full restorative school, so we have a lot of those conversations with kids. Um, you know, every time every time a kid says something mean to another student, it's not necessarily bullying. You know, in elementary school, they're learning what's socially acceptable, and and that's something that you know we try to teach our parents too. You know, if somebody says, oh, you look ugly today, it's not necessarily that they're trying to be a bully or I don't like your outfit today. It's our job to teach them that that might hurt someone's feeling. And, and that's where restorative work comes in. We still do have to suspend occasionally, but we try really hard not to, we, you know, so that's it. Thank Any you. questions? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. You know, I, I, I sympathize with your frustrations, but I also commend both of you for not giving up, as you said. I mean, obviously, you have to keep working at communications. You keep working at finding ways to correct the problem. So I commend you for that. And I, yeah. I, I, I know that you're frustrated, though. To it's frustrating, but it's, it is part of the job. You know, it's part of one of those parts that you just have to do, you know. Happy holidays to everybody. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Any, Burke. Anyone else have any comments? Um, go ahead, Mrs. Costa. Um, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I'm pretty sure that both of those principals um, are owed an, a round of applause as well because they went from uh, one points to three, if I'm not mistaken, and they were announced on the news for their yep. math so in uh english i think it was three star school yes so, so they went from a let's... one star school to a three star school so i just wanted to uh make sure they get that proper recognition um because both of them uh both of their schools went from one to three so i want to say thank you to them for that and um also my students speaking as a parent my students go to leo savoy and um Ms. Claudia is right. In the beginning of the year, it wasn't so easy. My kids would come home and ask me if they could fight because kids were being mean to them. And I, and my myself and Ms. Claudia had a conversation about my my nephew because he's not like that. Um, and it takes a lot for him to get upset and angry. And um, we worked really hard on that. Um, and Ms. Claudia especially recognizing when problems are there. Um, she's very quick with correcting those actions. Um, and my students are very, very happy today. Like she said, they went home and they were on cloud nine. They couldn't stop talking about their day today at school and how much fun it was. Um, so it, it goes a long way. And my nephew now seen another student, somebody was upset and that student wrote a nice note to the person that was upset and my nephew seen him do that and my nephew said well i can do that too so now every time there's a teacher that's upset or another student my nephew will write them a note of encouragement i believe miss cordia has one hanging in her office <laughs> um but he will write little notes of encouragement to whoever that student is that it's upset so like she said, kindness does spread. Um, and it just goes a long way with just little steps that we take as parents to instill it in our children. So I just want to say thank you guys for your hard work, both of you principals over there and every other principal as well that's come a long way with bullying and, and dealing with it. It does take a lot of patience. So thank you to you both over there as well as every other principal in this district. Great. Thank you, Mrs. Costa. Anyone else have a comment they'd like to make? Mr. Vice Chair. Dr. McGee, go ahead. I'd love to make a comment. Um, so tonight, you know, we concluded the presentations with, you know, Mrs. Coderre and Mr. DeRosier, um, letting, you know, the committee and the community know what, what their schools are doing. And, you know, we, we've seen all of the other principals uh, mm -hmm. at the podium talking about what, you know, the proactive measures that they're putting in place with their staff and their support staff. And, and I, I want to just echo with what Mrs. Costa said. I want to really thank our principals. I want to thank our support staff. I want to thank our teachers. They really work hard mm -hmm. to create welcoming, safe environments for our students, for our families, and for this community. Um, and they don't have easy jobs. Sure don't. But they work extremely hard, 
and they make our kids feel like they belong and they make our kids feel like they have a school that they can go to where there are adults and there are other peers there who are like a family. So I think that's something that is special to Winsocket. I really believe that and they work really hard and I just want to recognize our principals and our teachers and our staff and our students because we have great students. We have students that are very compassionate, that are very caring, uh, you know, just uh, the story that you were sharing with us, Mrs. Costa. So again, I want to thank them all for, you know, being true Villanovans. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Good. good comments. Excellent. And then thank you all for uh, coming tonight too with your presentations. And happy holidays. Happy holidays. Um, our, our next item is a presentation of the student assessment scores. Um, it's, it'll be led by Dr. Holt and several others. Yes, thank you. We have a team that will be talking tonight in regards to our um, accountability measures, the state accountability measures. So I also wanted to echo and I wanted to make sure we said again to our principals before they left, you'll see later on in the presentation that we talked about the schools, um, Vernon going from a one to a three star school. Savoy staying as a three-star school, um, Vernon becoming out of coming out of being a CSI school. CSI means comprehensive um, improve, support and improvement. I forgot yep. the acronym for a second, um, but it's a school that was identified that needed a little bit more support to, to be successful. And Vernon went from a one-star to a three-star. That is amazing work. And it's all due to the dedication of our principals and the staff who are in those buildings. So if you wouldn't mind indulging, one more clap for them. It's amazing. Absolutely. Thank you guys very much. So on to the hard work now. So we have our RICAS scores. They were released um, in the beginning of December. Um, as you can see on the first slide, our 2021-2022 reading proficiency as a district is 11.7 or 12 percent that is down one percent from the year before our math proficiency is 10.1 up six percent from the year before those are important statistics because what we're noticing is that we're following the same trend as the state as a whole rhode island has seen overall a decrease of about two percent in ela across the state and an increase of 6.8% in math. Massachusetts also saw the same trend in their MCAS scores. Massachusetts ELA went down about 5%, so it's a bigger dip in their ELA, and their math went up about 6 One of the things that the commissioner and our team has talked about is that math saw a steady increase. We were back in school, and math during COVID was a much more difficult task than it is when you're in the classrooms. Um, so we, that's why we're speculating. One of the reasons we're seeing the jump from last year, which had been a very COVID impacted school year to, uh, so the year before to last year, um, that why you're seeing those increases. We also listed for you where each of our schools are currently. And I'd like to draw your attention to the middle column, the yellow column. That column is our, our almost proficient or partially proficient, partially meeting proficiency. You'll see that that column has roughly 50% if you look at some of the different indicators for ELA. That means many of our students are on the cusp of becoming proficient or exceeding proficiency. And the work that we are doing through our high dosage tutoring, through our summer program, through the work that we're doing with the Department of Education through the LEAP grant, which is a grant to support districts that have had a significant impact from COVID, all of this work is to help those students in that yellow bucket become green. Um, same for math, we're in the same um, situation for math. And again, the focus as a state has really be, been to push um, understandings for math. Our district has been partnering with the Rhode Island Department of Education and a company called School Kit um, to work with training our teachers on academic language and math class so that the um, the language isn't the stumbling block for students in math when they're uh, attempting the test. I'll pause there for a second and see if there are any questions about RICAST. Uh, I have two brief questions. Um, 
what time of the school year are these tests taken? Great question. Um, so it was mid-March to through April, the end of April, around about the, that time frame. Yeah, it's a so window of opportunity for our students to take the test. So for the last group, the students were in school pretty much full time. That's Correct. Yeah. So when we get the results, yes, these results are from the spring of 22. Yes. And my, and my second question is, do the schools receive a breakdown and analysis of the questions and the answers? And are we able to pinpoint certain areas where they really need improvement? Yeah, great question. We do actually. We have a platform on, um, on RIDES portal that allows building principals and their school improvement teams to drill down to individual questions, see how many students got that question correct, what's the standard that question is trying to address, um, how did you compare or how did we compare to other students across the state so we can see the average score or the average um, um, what, what was most picked, if it was C is the correct answer, how many students picked C, um, and we can drill down and do item analysis. We also can look at individual students and their scores and drill down individually, so we have an MTSS meeting, um, which, which is multi-tiered support services, um, or intervention for our students, we can drill right down. And it's actually the driving force behind our school improvement plans, the CSIP plans that we were just talking about. It's what Vernon spent a year, Vernon and Coleman spent a year talking about and focused on um, so that they could see improved um, student performance. So oh, the final question. So after the analysis, then uh, some instructional plans are put into place in different classrooms by the teachers. Correct, yeah, and, and that plan is put together by the team at the school, the school improvement plan team. Um, for instance, one of the things that Coleman did when they looked through their data is that we are our MLL students, our students who speak multiple languages, we're struggling with adapting to, to translanguaging. And Rania and her department um, went into the school and provided uh, PSYOP training for um, the teachers, and it is sheltered, Instructional observation protocol. Um, it, it's a universal program for students who have um, um, other languages. They know other languages, and it's a support system to help them to be able to translanguage and to um, acquire English um, while also learning academics. So you're not doing them in silo; you're doing them together. That's great. Thank you. Yep. Then anyone else have a, a quick question at this moment? Okay, we shall move on to our second part of our presentation. Yeah, so I'll do the second part um, as well. So our second part looks at SATs and PSATs. Um, you can see here that for the 2021-22 for SAT ELA, we were at 40.3%. And hold on one second, let me just look at my notes here. Um, here we are. The state was at 47.1. So we were pretty, within about seven points of where the state was. Oh, I'm sorry, this is the SAT. 47.1 is SAT. So if you look at the bottom, 22.7. Uh, for math, we have for PSATs, 12.5% proficiency, and um, for SATs, 5.6% proficient. The state is at 25.3. Um, we have a ways to go for our uh, high school, our secondary, and working with PSATs and SATs, um, and we continue to focus on that. Um, as a matter of fact, our next, the next slide on here talks about um, our schools that were identified for needs, need supports. Um, as we mentioned, Vernon and Coleman have come out of that support structure, but our high school has entered. Um, our high school will be participating in the CSIP process this coming uh, spring and will be implementing the interventions starting in the fall. Do we have any questions on the PSAT, SAT? One thing I'd like to note is that we have two um, buildings in our district, two schools in our district that are three-star schools. Um, that is Savoy Elementary School and Vernon Elementary School. And the rest of our schools are two-star schools, except for the high school, which is at one star, and are in the CSIP process for next year. I just asked a question about the PSAT, SAT. Yeah. Um, are there classes at the high school that directly teach how to take the test? There are, yes, they do have some preparatory classes. We actually have partnered with, and I can't, I think it's Mastery Prep. I think that's the name of the program. Thank you, Dr. McGee. Um, Mastery Prep to offer um, tutoring on taking the test. Um, so th there are programs 
separate from their traditional class and the teachers also um, included in their in their instruction because because it's it's always been found that districts and towns who have students who can afford yeah. tutoring on SAT PSAT tend to do better yeah um, some schools will put in place courses um, I, I used to teach an SAT prep course um, and and having those courses helps increase the scores because it's not just it's not just the knowledge it's test taking skills <laughs> yes and and actually for some students they take the test multiple times but the only test score that counts for accountability purposes is the one in the statewide testing day so if a student has taken it six times before um, it, this one won't necessarily have the same impact for them as as the ones that they've taken prior to that Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, anybody else have a comment, uh, Mrs. Costa? Um, so I just have a quick question for you. So I know, like my kids, that they're in Leo Savoy. They come home with their math homework, and mm -hmm. they say, "Auntie, I need help." And I look at their math homework, and I say, "Huh?" <laughs> so it's a little bit difficult. Have we put into like place, or maybe thought about like? So groups for parents to maybe understand to help their kids a little bit more with homework because I know I would love to have a place where I could go I call my best friend because she's great with math and I take a picture of the homework she lives all the way in Maryland <laughs> and, I, and I take a picture of the homework and I say oh can you help me with this because I have I don't understand it and for me when I was in school I could never get past a number was a letter and a letter was a number so <laughs> I could never get past that concept it, now I understand it a little bit more because I'm learning with my kids. Yeah. But they're in third grade. I don't remember learning that stuff till I was in like sixth or seventh grade. So like curriculum has definitely changed a lot since I've been in school. So and it is a little bit difficult. I want to be able to help my kids, but. Sometimes yeah, solving for X sometimes can be an interesting process. Um, yes. That's a great question. And before COVID, we used to have parent nights when they would come into the school and we would have a math night or an uh, ELA night or a reading night um, and provide just what you were talking about, tips and tricks and strategies to help your student to be able to solve some of the problems. Um, we also have through our Eureka program something called Homework Helper, um, and that's a um, like a worksheet that can go home at the beginning of the unit um, that can assist parents to see what they're doing. I'll also tell you there are some interesting videos that you can look at um, that kind of walk you through some of the lessons. While I don't promote any of the individual videos because they're not created by our district, I know of uh, quite a few. Just um, to help us parents. Exactly, that we share at, at meetings at the schools and, and families um, for as a resource for them to be able to see what's the process for solving. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Anybody else? Mr. Bourget. I'm going to struggle through this. If we have all this help, right, is either the, there's not as many kids that we'd like taking these courses or this assistance because our scores are still so low. So what are we doing about that? Because if you're, you're telling me and you're nodding your head, your head yes, yep. we have all this stuff. Yet our kids still aren't getting it. If there are review courses, maybe there's not enough not enough students taking them, and maybe the parents need to, you need to bring them all in because these scores are terrible. That's an excellent point. It's something that, we're, that the high school will walk through this school this spring as they're looking for interventions in order to address these exact issues that you're talking about. Let's look at our mastery prep class. How many students are assigned to the class? How many students are attending? What is their participation rate? Uh, how do we increase that participation rate? How, you know, how many empty seats do we have and why are they empty? Um, those will all be questions that the high school team will look through while they're doing their what they call a needs assessment and root cause analysis. So it's a long, it's a lot of conversation looking at the data and trying to figure out what is it that's that's happening that's creating this situation. Because like you said, we have strong supports in place for students to be successful. So let's see what is what is the issue that the supports are not actually yielding the results that they should. You drill down, you can drill down into the, the students' answers. You can see the questions they failed or yes. they couldn't answer. You've got the answer. Those, those areas are not being taught as well as they should be.
Because obviously the next group, if there's similar questions from year to year, we're missing a boat on, on that battery of questions. Others were doing fine, but there's a whole bunch that were not. Correct. That's what's been concerning me for years sitting on the school committee, mm -hmm. that we're not getting there fast enough. Yes. I would agree with we're not getting there fast enough. We are doing exactly what you're talking about, drilling down and looking at individual questions. I will say that for RICAST, looking at the standard and the individual question really helps to, to instruct the students to, to learn that concept. The high school SAT, PSAT, as um, Mr. Burke mentioned, is there's multiple layers of do we know the content and do we understand the test taking strategy. So that's another course that we can look at offering and ensuring that the practice that students are doing in school is, is what is happening. Any of us who have been in accounting had review courses for the CPA exam because the exam is not just what you know. Correct. It's how you take the test. Correct. That's the most important part. So I would imagine that we should be implementing this full bore to get our kids doing better in these tests, be Correct. more encouraging for them. Correct. Hopefully we'll see better scores next year. That's, that's our goal. Continue moving forward. At this time, I'm going to pass it down to Rania to look at our reader access scores. Um, so the WIDA Access is a yearly English language proficiency assessment for multilingual learners um, that assesses students in listening, speaking, reading, and writing skills in academic contexts in English. Uh, the assessment is taken from January to February each year. So once we come back from vacation, we will be starting our assessment. Um, this assessment takes place, uh, this assessment places students in six uh, English language proficiency levels, entering, emerging, developing, expanding, reaching, and bridging. And in order to exit out of English for speakers of other language programming, a multilingual learner needs to score an overall proficiency of 4.8 or higher, um, which is the higher end of our expanding. So if you look at the first slide for we to access, you can see that next to each um, category level, Entering, merging, um, there's a number next to it. So entering students score between a 1.0 and a 1.9 and so on. Um, so this first slide shows the proficiency levels for the last three years. Um, so if you look at 2021, 2022, 95.1% of our multilingual learners took the assessment. 30.6% scored in the entering level. 25.6% scored in our emerging, 30.6% scored in developing, 12.1% scored expanding, and 1.1 scored in the bridging and reaching. So we had about 2% of our multilingual learners exit out of programming last school year. Um, the next slide shows a breakdown of our multilingual learners and their years of service. <coughs> so research shows that it takes five to seven years to become proficient in the English language. So this breaks it down um, based on the years of service. So our newcomers, we consider zero years or their first experience in English schools um, to two years. Our developing is three to six years of service. And our long-term L students are who have been in service for seven plus years. And then we also assess our students um, on the WIDA alternate access. So these students are students who are in our SID or medically fragile classrooms that do take this assessment. Um, that is about 1% of our multilingual learners who do take this. So um, each of these levels are a little different. So you can see the A1 is initiating. So that's initiating with the English language. Um, and so on. In order to exit out of English language services, if you are taking a WIDA <laughs> alternate access, you must score a, a level P2 for two consecutive years. So if you have any questions, yes. Yes, I'll, I'll just start with one to, to help the committee here. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us what WIDA means. Yes, so WIDA is the company, so World 
world-class instructional design assessment. Say it again, world. World-class instructional design assessment. So that's the company that houses it. Okay. And ACCESS stands for Assessing Comprehension and Communication in English, State to State for English Language Learners. Jeez. So it's a big, that's long a long <laughs> Yeah. So pretty much it's uh, assessing the English language proficiency of our okay. multilingual learners. And, and, and these are non-English speaking students that have come to us. Yes. And it's not really a, a test of sorts. It's our attempt to teach them how to speak English. And it could take a year. It could take seven, as you showed us. And, and they come in at different levels. Correct. Um, would, would, you, would you find that um, the, our students that come in, do they take seven years or do we do, are we doing better than that? No, it's, again, it's not a test. Yep, so it's, it's not, not a test. A, yeah. So um, it depends on the proficiency of the student in their home language. If they have a higher proficiency in their home language, it will take them a shorter time to exit out of services. Okay. Uh, another factor is um, the language difference between English. So if you're coming from an Arabic speaking country, you need to learn the whole alphabetic system before you can, well, we do it with, um, like Andrew was saying, through the SIAP model. So we do provide them with grade level content, but along with English language development, um, because there's a little bit of pieces that they really do need to focus on. Um, so like in Arabic, there's no vowels. So that's a whole different concept. Each symbol has four sounds to it. So it's a little different. So in order to acquire English, it takes a little bit longer. And one final question before I open it up. And, and these students, do they sit for the the RICAS tests and the SAT tests? Yes. As so well? if it is their first time in U.S. schools um, or in, yeah, in U.S. schools, they do not take the ELA portion. They still have to take the mathematics. So they say that they give them one year to acquire some English before they are assessed on RICAS. So our year two students will be taking both ELA and math, even though they have not reached proficiency <clears throat> on way to access. Correct. <laughs> Anyone else want to comment on that? Are those tests put in, in dual language or strictly in English? Strictly English. The only accommodation that they can have is the directions put in home language. Mathematics can be put in Spanish. There are no other languages as of right now. So it takes seven years to become proficient in English, but they make you take the test in two years. Correct, yes. Those studies all reflect on our, our, our it, scores. Yes. They are reflected. And last year, um, for the 21-22, 12% of our population were multilingual learners. We are now up to 14% of our population as multilingual learners. The school population, correct? Yes, correct. Anyone else have a comment? Ms. Costa? So if we, so these are obviously English is their second language. So if we realize that these students are having a little bit more trouble understanding English, how do we go about making those adjustments? Do we focus more one-on-one -on -one with that student? Is there more supports put in place for that student? How do we go about like recognizing that student's difficulties and working with them? Yep, it depends on the program. So in our elementary model, um, the classroom teacher is ESL certified. Um, so they have the knowledge to support the multilingual learners within the classroom. Um, usually their small group instruction is geared towards English language development, but they do have access to grade level material. Our middle school model is more of a collaborative model where we have a ESL teacher attached to the team. So that teacher supports a sheltered classroom and another classroom. So they are traveling with the students. Okay. And then high school, there's a different program as well. Okay, thank you. So, mm -hmm. Anybody else have a comment or anything to underscore? So just 14% of our students are multi-language learners right now. Correct. Is that, what's the state average? It depends. Oh, is, is there such sure. a? Sure. It depends on just, yeah, she's going to look at Thank you. I mean, are, are we one of the largest numbers in the state? We are. You, one don't, of have, you don't have to do, do that. So, yeah. We are one I, of the largest. I would expect the state average is much lower. That's... Does the state allow you to extrapolate those numbers, the English learning <laughs> numbers, as a, and leave them out? Of the RICAS data? I don't believe so. I didn't think so. Mm -mm. That's the problem. Yep. She didn't hear your question, Ms. Holt. 
Oh, she answered it. <laughs> She's like, okay, okay, Wobble or Rob? <laughs> he answered it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> now, who's taking over the, the next portion oh, of this presentation? I so I have the DLM part of it. So the DLM is the dynamic lantern map. Sorry, I have the same voice thing going on like everyone else. What's going um, on over here? <laughs> <laughs> so a few months back, I had spoken about the 1% on how the students in our severe intellectual disabilities classrooms take the alternate assessment. So these students do not take RICAS at all. So the state tries to have all districts be under the 1%, but like we had discussed before, sometimes it's not possible. Students that need to take the alternate assessment for various reasons um, take this assessment. Uh, the assessment window is from April to May. Um, and just to recap what our percentages are, um, during this testing window, our ELA was um, at 1.83% and our math was at 1.79% of students that were taking the, the DLM. So roughly it's about 50 students that we have district-wide that take the test. However, the only students that take the test are in grades three through eight and grades 11 for both math and ELA. And for science, it's only grades five, eight and 11. So with that said, I gave you the overall district average, not the middle school, elementary and high school separated. Um, because it's such a low number of students, I didn't want to be able to identify um, the students in, in the classroom and the subsets. So with that said, um, the first part is the ELA. Um, I gave you the information from year 2018, 2019, all the way down to 21, 22. So in, you can notice that in 2018, 2019, we were up to 61 students that had taken the DLM for ELA. In 21, 22, we were down to 49. That is a big dip from <clears throat> previous years due to students going from 11th grade to 12th grade, um, as well as other students um, going from eighth grade to ninth grade. So randomly through the years, as the students progress in their great grade levels, we'll have a higher percentage of students that take the DLM or we'll have a lower percentage of students depending on where those students fall. So with that said, um, uh, last year we um, had 12.2% of the students proficient on the DLM as and we were a little bit below the state with 21.9%. The next slide with the math, I did the same breakdown. We were at 6.1% the state was at 19.1%. And then with the science on the next page, um, we actually went up um, <clears throat> to 13.6% in the science, and then in the state, they had 16.2%. When I did the breakdown per school for myself, I saw that at the high school level, the high school and some areas at the middle school level were very close to the state average, if not above. Um, and when Kelly and myself took a look at why that would be, um, for the last few years, the high school has been using um, Unique and News to You as a um, program, um, an educational program that they've been using within the classroom to help um, facilitate their learning. It's their curriculum that they've been using. Last year, we implemented it more at the middle school and purchased it for the elementary, and we are doing trainings all this year to have the elementary and middle schools do the more in-depth training with news to you and unique to so that way they have a curriculum that they're following. Many times they were taking the curriculum that we had um, that the gen ed students were working on and modifying the curriculum as best they could to meet the needs of their students. So I'm hopeful that with the curriculum in place, um, it'll help support and bring up the numbers in the areas. Um, also, the state has provided uh, some um, professional development around the DLM mathematics. I, as a state, the mathematic numbers have gone down in the DLM, so they're trying to provide some feedback to our teachers on how to implement the DLM in math and incorporate it into their IEPs and support them more. Um, so we put that PD out to our teachers. I'm hopeful that some of them will participate and bring some of the knowledge back to our, our teams. Um, also, um, two years ago when um, Dr. Sullivan was with us, um, she had um, got us into the SET program, which is taking the dynamic learning maps and digging deeper and trying to train our teachers better in how to provide supports to students and get better at providing um, academic rigor for them. 
Um, in February of last year, Kelly um, Gerard and um, Maria Colado, my assistant um, at the middle school, have been working very diligently with the state and coming up with the models to be able to go to each school, work with the principal and the teachers that are teaching the students that are taking the DLM and making sure that they're providing the supports necessary to dig deeper into the curriculum for them. Um, so we are one of, I believe, five um, districts within the state that are participating in the SET program. Um, and we are pretty far along with the trainings that have been um, started. Do you have any questions at this point? Anybody have any questions? Sounds like a lot of work is being done, so well done. You know. yeah. And some of the areas, like I said, at the high school, they were at or above the state averages in um, some of the areas. Um, so, you know, they've been using the curriculum. So it just shows that when they have a curriculum that they're not creating and they're moving forward with it, the test scores will go up and it'll support them. Good. Very good. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Dr. Holt, final comments of your team and uh, your presentation? Yes, thank you. Um, Rania and I were able to get the statistic that you were looking for. So of the students tested in Rhode Island, 12.8% are identified as MLL students. So we're at 14 and the state um, of students tested. That was what was released this past week from the commissioner's office. Um, not the total, but of students tested. So 12.8. Um, I'd just like to say thank you for allowing us to share the data. And again, I would love to commend our schools for the progress that they have made, um, in particular, Burnin and Coleman um, exiting CSI. Thank you. Excellent. Well done. Thank you all. Thank you. Very good. At this, this time now, I will then make a motion to receive and place on file all these presentations. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Costa. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 The ayes have it. Moving on now to the superintendent's report. He will begin with uh, personal matters update and then an update on the nonviolent institute. Thank Dr. you. McGee. Thank you, Vice Chairman. <clears throat> Excuse me, it's happening to me too. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm going to start with the personnel matters update. We have added three certified positions since our last school committee meeting. We've also added two non-certified positions. And as you can see, we have many hourly stipend and extracurricular uh, positions um, that we have added as well uh, across the district. Any questions about the personnel mm -hmm. before well, I move I on to the nonviolence? Yep, please. Great. So I'm, I'm very excited um, later in the, on the agenda, we're going to be, um, appro be hopefully approving the, um, the MOU between the Woonsocket Education Department and the Nonviolence Institute, which will officially begin the work that we're going to um, embark on with them, with, that, uh, with those folks from Providence. So far, we, we have had meetings, even though we haven't officially signed the MOU, we have had meetings with the executive director and um, workers from the Nonviolence Institute. We've held um, meetings with the staff at the high school where I introduced <coughs> the members of the Nonviolence Institute, talked a little bit about their role in the uh, school district, specifically at the high school, and to a lesser degree at the middle schools. We also scheduled a meeting recently with parents um, to, to let them know you know, about the work that we'll be doing with the Nonviolence Institute. And soon after we come back from vacation, Mr. Guillo is gonna be scheduling assemblies, small assemblies with students to um, introduce the nonviolence folks to them and to talk to our students about nonviolence and you know what support they're gonna be providing, specifically the high school. So uh, I'm excited that we're finally gonna start uh, officially the work and the partnership with them. Um, one of the things that we've added recently as well, which the Nonviolence Institute um, have been and will continue to be a part of, is we have biweekly um, safety cabinet meetings um, on Mondays, Monday morning. And that's an opportunity for uh, the principal of the high school, the principals of the middle schools, um, Gigi DiBello, who was our project aware coordinator, um, the Nonviolence Institute and our, our school resource officers and on some occasions Chief Oates and we talk about things that may have happened in the community the weekend prior to Monday so that our administrators are prepared for any any types of violence that might have occurred over the weekend and also 
any events that may have occurred, you know, the previous week or or just leading up to to that Monday, so that our our schools are are you know can be proactive when when students come back in on Mondays. So that we've had about three of those meetings. We're, as I said, we're going to continue those, and they've been very productive so far in trying to get a sense of you know what's happening in the community, what's happening in the schools around conflict. Uh, the, the inability to, to resolve conflict and um, as well as, uh, you know, just any any type of types of violence that may have occurred in the community. So, you know, we're again, you know, I, I can't, you know, um, stress any, any greater how how thrilled I am to have them coming on board to work with us as we move forward. And I will be presenting to the committee just, you know, um, updates as to how that partnership and collaboration is going <clears throat> with the with the institute throughout the course of the school year. So Dr. McGee, you make a good point that uh, our schools are not isolated units, mm -hmm. that things that happen in the community are brought into our schools. And obviously this, this group here is able to address or let us know yeah. in, in the schools what's going on outside to help out. And that, sure. that's a great point. And We're also going to be partnering with the Health Equity Zone um, it's not a part of this MOU with the Nonviolence Institute, but through the Health Equity Zone, which is uh, an organization that there's a health, there are multiple health equity zones across the state. We have one in Rhode Island, in, um, in Woonsocket, and that's an organization that is, um, that's associated with Thundermist. And they, um, their, their, their goal or, or their mission is to provide um, <clears throat> healthy, um, whether it's mental health or, or, you know, physical health, um, nutrition, uh, but opportunities, positive opportunities for the uh, community, uh, which includes naturally our youth. So they're going to be a part of our meetings as well, um, because the that partnership that we're going to be establishing with them, there will be a community outreach worker who will be working with us at the high school and at the district level, who will sort of have their, you know, their ear to the ground in the community and will be able to you know, work with us and work with families around the various um, incidents and issues that that stem from the community and, you know, seep into the school and some that start in the school and seep into the community. Mm -hmm. So that's great. That's going to, um, you know, that's going to be an exciting part of the work as well. Anyone have any comments, for Dr. McGee, about this topic? No. Then I will make a motion to receive and place on file <clears throat> the superintendent's report. Is there a second? Okay. Second. Second by Dr. Uh, Chairman Bourget and Mrs. Costa. Uh, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 The ayes have it. And we are moving on now to our school subcommittee reports. We have three subcommittees I must have met recently, a CLAC update, a building communication update, committee update, and a curriculum update. Uh, the CLAC update, Mrs. Kapiskus. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, the CELAC met on December 1st. Um, we had a presentation at our meeting, and in the interest of efficacy, since we have a rather long agenda, the presentation was by Katie Condi and Ivone Sagastumi of RIDE, uh, excuse me, RIDE Pen, Rhode Island Parent Information Network, who provided information about the services that are available through RIDE, and in particular, the streamlined access to services that are being provided by students who are referred by the Woonsocket School Department. Uh, we have staff in each of the school who can access the streamlining process of directing parents uh, to ride, to ride, I keep saying that, right pen for assistance. Um, anybody who's interested in that particular presentation, I have um, minutes from the CELAC meeting that I will share with you. Under old business, um, I reminded everyone that the Council for Secondary Education at Ride had now approved as of November 15th. The new graduation requirements which will impact the class of 2028 the current seventh graders, and there's still no real provision made in these regulations to address students with IEPs or MLL students. Um, I again address the need as acting chair for us mm. to locate parents who are willing to act in a leadership position for CELAC with the advice and uh, guidance of the current acting chair. Uh, Dr. <laughs> McGee's comments included again comments with regard to these graduation requirements that they're designed basically to make students ready for a four-year college and not every student is headed in that direction. But the WED will be meeting with families beginning with the seventh graders to advise on the impact of these new regulations. 
Um, he reminded parents about parent-teacher conferences, which were occurring the following week. Um, Ms. Morell advised about how it had been another busy month at the uh, special education department that she was conducting interviews with hopes of filling open TA positions and the open LEA position at Pothia, which I believe has now been filled. And with <laughs> that, the meeting was adjourned at 6.57 p.m. That concludes my report, Mr. Vice Chair. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Kapiskas. Nice and short. <laughs> Have you seen our agenda? <laughs> <laughs> the next meeting it is today is during the fifth, I think. Yeah, the fifth. The, yeah. yeah, at six p.m. virtually. Um, if you want the link, send me an email, and I'd be happy to share it with you. Is that the right date? Yeah, during the fifth. Yep. Do we have any questions for? No. no. Okay, I'll make a motion to receive and place on file the CLAC update. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Costa. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. Moving on now to the building committee update. Mr. Notarani, take over. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. So there is no update for the building committee this evening. We did, we did not have a, a recent meeting, um, but we will be having one at the beginning of January. That Another nice and short one. All right, let's keep it going. So disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> me, me too, me too. Very good. We, want, okay. we were looking forward to hearing you talk, Mr. Nodorani. <laughs> we need to make a motion? No, 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 okay. no need for a motion. Okay, let's, let's see if something someone has something to say about the next one. <laughs> Curriculum update. Um, Ms. Kapiskas and... Chairman Bouge. I figured it's not. <laughs> it's um, all you, Ms. Kapiskis. We'll, we'll try to do a little bit longer to make you happy, Mr. Burke. Um, the curriculum subcommittee met on November 29th at 2 p.m. Um, after approving minutes, we discussed the readiness based graduation requirements, the new secondary regs um, that are being imposed in order to obtain a high school diploma. They do not currently address the needs of IEP and MLL students with different challenges by providing any waivers of these requirements and local requirements by the regulations themselves cannot be less than these new state requirements, but can be more. The new regulations are based around state local uh, credit requirements, real world relevant proficiencies, college and career readiness and proficiency based requirements, also known as our portfolio or senior project. The amended regulations were approved by ride on 1115 and had removed the mandatory completion of the F FAFSA as a diploma requirement. However, the FAFSA is still being strongly encouraged, and it's expected that the failure to meet the, cert a certain the failure of a certain uh, percentage of seniors completing the FAFSA may affect the district's STAR report going forward. I did ask the David Sienko at Ride about that. He said he hadn't heard that, but he was going to check into it for me. <laughs> um, but he, he said it wouldn't surprise him. Um, Dr. Holt will be presenting to the full school committee the requirements uh, for approval on a future date, um, as the new requirements must also be approved locally. Uh, we talked about the vocational school students who are impacted, particularly with regard to the fourth math credit, which can be a flex credit, and he gave detailed presentation on the programs that are available at the WAC Tech, which could allow students to achieve this um, flex program credit this flex credit that they will need in order to meet the 20 credit requirement. Um, there was a long list of the various uh, programs that would be available. I will not bore you with the details, uh, but it does. it is clear that um, there are many options available for our students to be able to earn the required credits while still attending the vocational program. Uh, the next topic is something that's later on our agenda, credit weight for college courses. There have been some students who are taking college level courses at both the WAC Tech and the high school with either concurrent enrollment or dual enrollment. Our current grading policy does not address this issue, but the handbook uh, provides that students who take honors courses or advanced placement or AP courses are given extra weight in terms of grading in their GPAs. While the handbook is actually silent on the actual weight, the practice has been to provide five bonus points for students in honors classes and 10 bonus points for students in AP classes, which is how when we're all confused on honors night and senior awards night, how a student can have 115 when they graduate, that's how they have 115 uh, as an average. 
Parents of a current student have inquired as to whether additional GPA weight will be given to these college courses in terms of a student's GPA. Most districts treat them, these dual, dual or concurrent college classes, as AP classes for weight. The bump up, so to speak, is not dependent on a student passing the proficiency or AP test for the college credit, and the high school would like to treat these college classes as AP classes and give the bump up typically given to students taking AP classes. After much discussion, it was agreed that the way to accomplish this in time for our current seniors is for the full school committee to vote to amend the current high school handbook to include these classes in the extra weight language that is currently provided for in the high school handbook. This amendment will apply retroactively only to the current high school students, classes of 23, 24, 25, and 26. The chair will prepare, that with me, will prepare draft language to be circulated to the full school committee before their next meeting so they can understand what the amendment is that is being proposed. Uh, all agree that at some point the actual weight given to these courses should be reflected in both the district grading policy, which we are reviewing currently, as well as the high school handbook. After this discussion, I discussed with um, Ms. Blaze, who advised that the school committee doesn't really approve the handbooks any longer. But we did, um, I did prepare draft language that would be in effect for the class of 2023 going forward, not retroactively, so that any student who took current um, college dual or concurrent enrollments in prior years cannot come back to us, ask for the bump up to increase their class rank. It's only for students prospectively going forward as well as the class of 2023 and that's why we're pushing it through tonight so that it can apply to the class of 2023 and that will be on our agenda for later on uh two hours later we adjourned and our next meeting wow. i do not remember when that is i don't even i think we scheduled it but i don't remember when it is and i apologize January 10th, i think <coughs> Ms. Kapiskis, one, one question about that? Absolutely. The, uh, the college course bump up, that would be like an AP, is that also retroactive to the fall semester? Of this year. Of this year. And only of this year. It yes. is already, okay, okay. Because um, as Mr. Gill explained to us, placement and valedictorian and salutatorian are determined based on first semester, mm -hmm. which is why we thought it was important to push this through before those first, sem first semester grades became final grades that the bump up could be given to the students who took those courses this semester, fall. Good to hear, okay. And we'll be voting on that. We will later be voting on. on that under new business. Right. Anybody have any other comments, questions? Okay, do I have to do anything with that? Oh, yes, I do. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I'll make a motion to receive and place on file the curriculum update. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Costa. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Wonderful. All right, moving on now to conferences and discussions. Uh, we have a financial update by Mr. Perry, and then we have a special education update by Mrs. Morell. We'll begin with the financial update by Mr. Perry. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. In front of the school committee this evening is the uh, October 31st, 2022, Socket Education Department General Fund Fiscal Update. Currently, the school department is projecting a $156,000 surplus for the year. On to some financial highlights for that. Uh, revenues at this time are on pace pretty much across the board. Nothing to report there out of the ordinary at the moment. On the expenditure side, all regular salaries are $2.075 million under budget at this time. And when netted with the employee turnover allowance of $1.470 million, this will put the overall salaries $605,000 under budget. Substitute salary line is projected to be $160,000 over budget due to several vacancies spread across the district. Medical expenses are currently $520,000 over budget. Uh, for the first quarter of the year, medical expenses have been higher than anything experienced since the beginning of the pandemic. During our next finance subcommittee meeting, we will be scheduled, which will be scheduled in the next few months, we will begin a discussion about possibly using our OPEB funds to begin paying retiree medical expenses down. Uh, again, to reiterate what we talked about last time, medical is high, but the last few months it has seemed to come down a little bit. Uh, so that's a that's a promising promising thing. Uh, hopefully, we'll continue that trend. Also available is our medical set-aside. Uh, we have a little over a million dollars there. When we get to the subcommittee, we can discuss and strategize our options for potentially using some of those funds to cover some of these expenses this year. 
additional speech therapists, contracted nursing services, personal care attendants, and behavioral interventionists have been needed this year beyond what was originally budgeted. We have begun moving some of these expenses into ESSER 3 in order to cushion the overall expense to the general fund, and we'll continue to monitor that going forward. We currently have moved expenses off the general fund at this time for building improvements, furniture and fixtures, and technology-related hardware. These have been transferred to our capital funds, and again, these will be monitored going forward. As, as I stated earlier, we are currently projecting a $156,000 surplus for the fiscal year at this time. Uh, we still do have flexibility under our ESSER 3 and ESSER LEAP grant to uh, deal with any situations that may arise this fiscal year. Even with some of the expenses being over budget at this time in the general fund, we can continue to move forward with confidence for this fiscal year. So uh, I know it's still a little early. We are only through October at this point, but we are on target and we will continue to monitor expenses as we go throughout the fiscal year. So at this time, if the school committee has any questions, I'd love to answer them. Answer two. Esser 2. Where do we stand? Esser 2 right now. We hey, Chairman Bourget, you would like to speak? Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, Remember, you go through the yes. acting vice chair right now. Yes. Uh. <laughs> Mr. Vice Chair. Okay. Oh, we have a floor. Do you need a translation? Yes, I do. In English. <laughs> Esser 2 is pretty much wrapped up at this point. If you look at what we have encumbered throughout the year, uh, we will be moving some of those expenses off, but I believe by June 30th, that grant will be fully expended. So we are doing a, uh, I have to, I have to uh, commend the administrative team here. They really spend money well. <laughs> <laughs> That's your job to control it, isn't it? Oh, oh, the hammer's about to be dropped. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, uh, well, well, the, th the thing is this, though, and all joking aside, the way that these grants are set up, I mean, you have to spend through them. There's no carry forward on this. And if you don't spend the money, then you look at like, well, why didn't you spend the money? We gave you all this money. Why are you not spending it? So it, it is a difficult balance to ramp up expenditures when you know uh, 18 months from now, we're going to be kind of on the other side of the coin. So... It's, it's a difficult balance, but I think we've done a good job. And honestly, I would rather see us step down a little bit going into the next fiscal year as opposed to having to ramp up to meet our expenditure goals and then fall off a cliff the following fiscal year. So uh, I think we're, we're, we're on a good pace. Uh, I, think, I think things are being spent according to plan, and uh, we're going to keep an eye on expenditures. We're going to have no problem this year. We're going to have a great budget for next year. Uh, God help us fiscal year 25. I, I guess that's uh, that's where we're at right now. So well, there's your there's your ESSER recap. Thank you. Thank you, um, Mr. Mr. Perry. Mr. Perry, I do have a, a couple of questions. Um, I was looking at some of, the, I guess, the fine print that I hadn't looked at before, and I was looking at tuition that we pay outside the district, tuition to other schools within the state, $800,000. Tuition to other schools outside the state, $125,000. And here's what got my attention. Tuition to private sources, $6,450,000. On top of that, tuition to charter schools, $1,450,000. Now, the reason why I began to look at that is that I read in the Rhode Island map in the Boston Globe that Rise Prep has put in the proposal, which I'm sure they approved, to expand. And their expansion is going to take 10 years. They're going to begin by expanding to a 9 to 12 high school and then begin a second K to 8 elementary school. And they're talking a 10-year expansion. Now, what got my attention, though, in this story is that they're going to go from right now um, 430 students to 1,450 students. Now, you, we could deal with percentages, and we can say that, look at the percentage of public school students, I mean, of, of, of students we're going to lose in the public schools. But what got our attention, and it's obviously not something that many of us are going to have to be dealing with in 10 years, our payment for all this is now going to be $15,634,000. 
<laughs> Need I say more? Mr. Perry, I, I did ask you earlier if you could explain, I mean, tuition to private sources, $6 million. And, and I know it's needed. We're not questioning, I'm not questioning, I don't think anybody questioned the need for some of these payments for our students. But, um, but what are we looking at? That, that, that these numbers show, and also the potential of $15 million in several years. So, so what we are looking at here, uh, the Rhode Island Uniform Charter of Accounts does provide a guide for breaking out tuitions paid to other school districts. Uh, we can start right at the, right at the top there, uh, 55610, tuition to other school districts within the state. Uh, currently, uh, that was an $800,000 budget. We're currently projected to be $762,000. That line mainly deals with the tuitions that we're paying to other public school districts in relation to CTE expense. So our, our biggest expenses in that line, we, we pay Cumberland and we pay <laughs> North Smithfield, uh, the biggest majority of, of that right there. And that is directly related to CTE programs that they're running that our students are attending that we need to pay. Um, the next line down, 55620, tuition to other uh, school districts outside the state. Uh, that's a rarely used line for us. We did budget $125,000. We currently have no expenses there, but on occasion there will be a special education student that would go to a, 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 a placement that would qualify and fall under that line. 55630, tuition to private sources. Now this is where um, the majority of the students on this line are again, uh, the special, the high need special education students at placements like Bradley Hospital, uh, Action Based Enterprises is one. Uh, there's there's several other placements. The Wolf School, that's that's another one. Uh, that's where uh, the majority of our tuition is paid, and that's where the biggest line is. As you can see, we budgeted 6.4. We're currently projected at 6.1. Um, but yeah, this is just uh, it, it's just the expense. This is not. These placements are not cheap, as you can see, uh, but they are needed for the school district. Uh, 55640, tuition to educational service agencies uh, within the state of Rhode Island. That was uh, $1.3 million budgeted, and we're almost at 1.2 million expenses. Uh, the only school that falls under that that we currently pay is the Northern Rhode Island Collaborative. So everything on that line is pointed to them. And then finally, 55660, tuition to charter schools, $1.4 million budgeted, uh, $1.4 million uh, to be paid currently. Uh, those are the charter schools that we pay within uh, the district here. The two two biggest being uh, Mayoral Academy and Beacon Charter. Uh, those are the, the two heavy hitters here. And then we have a, a small smattering, spattering, excuse me, of uh, tuitions that we pay throughout the state at other charter schools. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Perrier, for just providing the information because I, I think uh, people should know, you know some other factors that affect just us taking care of, you know, school students within our own schools. Um, and again, many obviously this is needed for some of it, um, but do look uh, look into the future though. You know, fifteen million dollars that we're going to have to pay to three charter schools, no, five charter schools. Uh, in the city, the, um, who knows what position we'll, we're all going to be in. Currently for the Mayoral Academy, um, they add 40 students every year. Uh, the agreement is half the students would come from Woonsocket and half the students would come from outside of Woonsocket. So essentially the charter school is adding 80 students every year, 40 of them being billed to Woonsocket and then 40 being billed to the other districts where the, the students are being sent from. Uh, but that's been, we've added 40 students every year for the last seven years. So we started at 40 and now we're at, I think, 320 because we're up to seventh. They're currently up to seventh grade right now. So there'll be one more year and then that I think will be the end of their current, uh, what they currently have on the books with Ride. And then what happens going forward from there, we don't know. Anyone else have any comments? Mr. <laughs> Boje, with pleasure. <clears throat> this is where the fair funding formula, it's one of the reasons it needs to be changed because it doesn't recognize all the expenditures we have for special kids who have to go out of district for whatever reason and we're incurring high costs. 
In addition, if they don't do anything, if the fair funding formula is in change relative to charter schools, I agree with Vice Chair Burke because I saw the same numbers that a lot of the districts are going to go under because you're not, we're not going to have the funds to support this. We're going to lose attendance. We're going to lose funding. And on top of that, we're going to have to pay for the additional students. And this is something uh, possibly we've got to, we have, we have to sit down with our reps and our senators uh, in our city, in our council, because if we don't stop making noise now, as, as time goes on, we're going to be in, we're going to be in a lot of trouble financially because unless the state comes in and just pours money at us, uh, that's one thing, but I, it doesn't seem that that's the way it goes. I don't know what you think about that. It's, it's probably, it's who knows, but those are, those are really the underpinnings to our future budget. If we don't look at this now, we're going to, it's going to be a real problem. I know people keep saying they're looking at the fair funding formula Well, they're looking at it, but I haven't heard any real changes yet because it's a political football. Really, really haven't. Providence. N nothing's really been done as far as the fair funding formula since right. its inception. Right. Uh, it's pretty much the, You're uh, on your own. it's pretty much the same thing that was out of the box when, when they rolled it out. Correct. Thank you. Anybody else have a comment? <laughs> Vice Chair? Yes. Spiscus. The other problem is that right now, the charters were intended to be what magnets are in Providence, where a particular charter would focus on a particular area, maybe an engineering charter or a nursing charter. That's not what charters have become, at least in Woonsocket, as well in other, as in other districts. They become a duplicate school system where they don't have to worry about budgeting because they present a bill to the local districts where their students come from and we get to pay it. And everyone screams that you want to have smaller class sizes in one socket. We could have smaller class sizes like the charters do if we had an unlimited budget like the charters do because the charters decide they're going to have 20 kids in a classroom and then simply present us with a bill to pay for it which is why our students have 30 students in a classroom because we can't afford that kind of money because we have to divert that kind of money towards charters. Now, I understand the big chunk of that money is for special ed. Guess what? Kids with IEPs are entitled to a free and appropriate public education. And if sitting in a public school classroom is not appropriate for them, we have to find the appropriate setting and we have to provide it free to them, but it surely is not free to the district. And the problem is everything I'm reading in the Providence Journal on the state level is saying there are legislators that are agitating to look at the fair funding formula. The leadership has no interest whatsoever. So we really do have to press very hard on the state representatives, not just ours, all of them, to review the state fair funding formula to make it truly fair, because it is not to districts like Woonsocket, to districts like Providence that have very costly special needs students. And that number only increases with all of what's left of us, with what's left with us by COVID, not just physically, but emotionally. Those rise all those costs. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you. Great comments. Anybody else? Okay, very good. Um, a motion now, I will make a motion to receive and place on file the financial update. Is there a second? Second. Second by Chairman Boger. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Thank aye. you. Uh, now, um, special education update by Mrs. Morell. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. So just to piggyback a little bit off of what uh, Mrs. Kapiskis and everyone has been talking about, um, we've been working very closely um, with both the middle schools and the high schools to take a look at our behavioral programs and the supports that we have within districts, as well as our SEL program at the middle school to help support the students in district as much as we can um, before having to do out of district placements. Right now, a lot of our out of district placements are kind of in the same boat that we're in, where they're not um, able to take more students on because they are short staffed themselves. Um, and 
they are losing staff. A lot of the staff are leaving and coming to the school districts. Um, so we're looking um, in-house to strengthen our, our behavioral programs and our special ed supports um, for middle school and high school. Um, and I started conversations with Bradley Hospital of possibly bringing in a elementary component um, in the year to come. Um, so we're just starting those um, conversations now. Um, so we're, we're really looking to try to bring things in-house like other districts have done. Um, to try and save some of those funds, um, but it's not easy to do. Um, I did have to close one of my classrooms recently because we didn't have a certified teacher um, to support those students, um, and some of those students I did have to place out of district. because I just had to support them. Um, but sometimes, um, you know, the appropriate setting is not the public school. Um, so we're taking a look at every student individually. And Ellie Van Hal, my out-of-district coordinator, um, who does all my IEPs, um, has done a tremendous job of bringing students back in that can transition back in to help save funds, um, but also moving students around to the other um, placements if they need a different type of placement. With that said, we're also working very closely um, with the TIDES Mobile Response Unit. This program is supplying wraparound services for families to help crisis-related issues to avoid police or hospital interventions for students in pre-K to 12. This is a program that has been around for a while um, to support um, their inner city um, schools that have been um, connected with Project AWARE. Gigi DiBello has done a tremendous job with bringing um, the district to the table um, with TIDES. Um, and the program is funded through the Exec Executive Office of Health and Human Services. So when there's a, um, a student in need um, before, um, if it's a student we're kind of thinking that they need a little bit more support than what we can provide, with the permission of the um, parent, we can um, contact TIDES Family Services and do wraparound services um, with them to support them and they'll help the whole family um, to try to prevent a hospital stay or anything like that. Um, so that's a new program that we're, we're supporting and connecting with. Um, and we're looking to, um, in the future, um, do more connections with them to have um, some of their uh, mobile response unit staff um, be implemented within um, some of our um, committees within house. Um, so an MOU may be coming to you in the near future. Um, with that said, um, below are my um, special education numbers. The last time I presented was in October. Um, the total enrollment is slightly lower by four students. Um, and the total percentage of students that are receiving special education services right now from pre-K to 12 is slightly below. Um, in October, it was 24.7%, um, whereas now it's 24.5%. Um, again, those are the students that are in-house, not including our out-of-district numbers. Do you have any questions at this time? Anybody have any questions or comments? Maybe to help people understand, we're talking every one out of four students have special needs services mm -hmm. in the district. Mm -hmm. Some of them, it's, so at the younger levels, um, pre-K to like grade Three, it's all, many times it's speech articulation or language um, acquisition, um, uh, how they're um, receiving language and how they're expressing their language. Um, so a lot of that is just through the speech pathologist. Um, as they get older, um, as you see the breakdown in the numbers, um, typically the younger students, there are more IEPs in the younger grades due to the speech only IEPs. Um, sometimes they grow out of the articulation um, or the um, the lisp that they might have, or um, they they strengthen the language skills and they they don't need the services any longer. However, sometimes it morphs into needing more. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, um, so I'll make a motion. I'll make a motion to receive and place on file the special education update. Do a second. Second. Second by Mrs. Costa. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, we're moving now into unfinished builds business. And our first item is a discussion and approval on the out of school instruction for temporary disabled students policy. Second passage, Mrs. Kapiskis and yours truly. Um, 
I'll make a motion to discuss and approve the out of school instruction for temporary disabled students policy for second passage. Do I have a second? Okay, second by Chairman Bourget. Is there any amendments that anyone like to make? Any changes? Any, do you have any questions? This is for second passage. Uh, we did discuss it at the last meeting. Are we all good? Uh, I will make a motion then uh, to ask Dr. McGee for a roll call vote. Chairman Bourget? Yes. Vice Chair Burke? Yes. Mrs. Kapiskis? Yes. Mrs. Costa? Yes. Mr. LeClaire? Yes. <coughs> okay, the motion passes. Okay. Uh, we're now we're going to discuss the discussion and approval on the medical marijuana policy. Second passage, Mrs. Kapiskis and myself. Uh, unlike, I will make the motion to discuss and approve the medical marijuana policy for second passage. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Chairman Boger. Uh, is there any discussion, any concerns? Anybody have any questions? Mr. Vice okay? Chair. Yes. <coughs> it's best to bring to everyone's attention that when we passed it for first passage in November, there was some language omitted from the Medical Marijuana Administration policy and language that was was accidentally omitted was the prohibition against self-administration and that's now been put back in for the uh, second passage um i asked council whether we had to go back to first passage and they said that it wasn't a big enough change to require us to go back to first passage it was language that was originally in there when it came out of policy which it was just inadvertently omitted and it was intended to address particularly the 18 year olds mm -hmm that the marijuana cannot be administered, administered by themselves. It has to be administered, administered by a parent, guardian, or parent appointed representative. And I just wanted to bring that to everyone's attention. We have to vote that in as an amendment? No. Oh, okay. So it's, it's all set to vote for second passage yes. as is. Okay, thank you. Uh, roll call, Dr. McGee. Chairman Bourget. Yes. Vice Chair Burke. Yes. Mrs. Kapiskis. Yes. Mrs. Costa. Yes. Mr. LeClaire. Yes. Okay. Moving on now to the discussion and approval on the memorandum of agreement with the Nonviolence Institute. Um, I'll make a motion. Um, this, this item had been tabled from the last meeting. So I will make a motion first to remove this item from the table. Second. Second by Chairman Bourget. Roll call, Dr. McGee. Chairman Bourget. Yes. Vice Chair Burke. Yes. Mrs. Kapiskis. Yes. Mrs. Costa. Yes. Mr. LeClaire. Yes. Very good. It is untabled. Now I'm going to make a motion to discuss and approve the memorandum of agreement with the Nonviolence Institute. Do I have a second? Second. Second, second by Chairman Boger. Um, and roll call. Vote. No, I'm sorry. Now discussion. Dr. McGee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Uh, so this MOU, which, which is actually, it, it's a consulting and training service agreement between the Woonsocket Education Department and the Nonviolence Institute, so it's similar to an MOU, um, would begin uh, this evening, December 21st, 2022, and it would expire on um, June 30th, 2023. And we would be looking to continue this work with them from year to year over the next three years. However, this, uh, this agreement would just be from year to year. Um, some some highlights of this agreement, the services that the Nonviolence Institute will provide the WED would be to consult with myself or my designee um, consulting with the Nonviolence Institute. Uh, the executive director would be meeting with myself or designees regularly or as needed. Uh, they will also provide one four-hour introductory training for up to 30 Winsocket Education Department employees, including middle and high school administrators, central office administrators, and Woonsocket Education Department outreach workers um, from the HES, which I had discussed with you, I had mentioned earlier. Uh, they would also provide one 40-hour training course for up to 15 uh, WED employees, including Woonsocket High School nonviolence team, which would include administrators, uh, teaching staff, and students. Uh, they will also provide um, any manuals and materials that are that are necessary um, in their um, uh, principles of, of nonviolence and conflict resolution that they would be um, working with us on. Uh, the compensation would be nineteen thousand two hundred dollars uh, for the year. That money is not locally; it's, it's not coming out of our local funds, but it's coming out of our Project Aware uh, funds, grant funds. Um, so it would not be at a cost to the to the district. Um, I'd like to, you know, answer any questions that the committee may have at this time. Anybody have any comments, questions? Nope. Uh, okay. I think we're good. 
Okay. Chairman Borgé? Yes. Vice Chair Burke? Yes. Mrs. Kapiskus? Yes. Mrs. Costa? Yes. Mr. LeClaire? Yes. Let's go with the MGM line. <laughs> Okay, now we uh, have we finished our unfinished business. Yep. Yes. Okay, now we're in new business. Unbelievable! How many pages is this agenda? All right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm going to get blamed for a long meeting, but it's not really my fault. I just, it's not really. I just sat in here. Okay, new business. <laughs> Well, oh, there it. is. There is. Okay. All right. Hurry up. I'll talk fast. All right. New, new business. Discussion and approval on school committee appointments to subcommittees. Dr. McGee. Oh, motion. And, and to think we said. Oh, motion to discuss and approve the school. Wait a minute. Second. Okay. Second. Um, any discussion <laughs> about it? Did any, we saw that <coughs> made their choices? Everybody's ex comfortable with their with their choices. I guess. You have no choice. You, you have no choice with your choices. Okay. okay. So with that being said, uh, Dr. McGee, uh, roll call vote. Chairman Bourget? Yes. Vice Chair Burke? Yes. Mrs. Kapiskas? Yes. Mrs. Costa? Yes. Mr. LeClaire? Yes. Excellent. Uh, moving on now, discussion and approval on the amendments to the Durham Bus Company contract. First of all, uh, was this ever tabled? No. Yes. We just it was. No, we just. No, it wasn't. No, I thought we just it was. I thought discussed. we continued it. No, it was a long time ago. Long time ago. Long, 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 long time, time ago. Okay, moving on. Motion to discuss and approve the amendments to the Durham Bus Company contract. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Chairman Bourget. Mr. Notarani. Hope you have something to say this time. <laughs> <laughs> I think he does, Mr. Vice Chair. He looks shocked. <laughs> Would you like me to start? <laughs> 10 o'clock deadline. Yeah, no. So, <laughs> so at this time, Durham is <clears throat> Durham's doing everything that they possibly can to get the buses to the schools for arrival and dismissal. At, at this point, in fairness to Durham, there are some circumstances that are beyond their control. For example, um, construction on Cass Avenue. Um, we've received an exceptional amount of waivers from our building, from parents requesting of our building principals who've approved waivers for students with special circumstances. And as a result of that, um, it would be unfair for us to hold Durham accountable for their delays in arrival and dismissal based on those circumstances. I do think it's worth when we convening the new year to have a discussion about several things I think we can do to make things better. But at this point, it um, it, it wouldn't be fair to, to continue to say that they um, that, that it's something on their end. Don't get me wrong, Durham's still Durham. Hmm. But but often, I, I know Scott and we've talked about at Savoy, unfortunately Savoy and Globe Park are at the end of the runs. And oftentimes, each day I get a daily email that I share with the principals, and oftentimes it'll be reflected in the email that they hit construction or severe congestion and traffic at the high school, which has impacted them there. Um, most recently, we did discover an issue at the middle schools that Ms. Morrell discovered and addressed at the middle schools. Um, but we fixed that, and all the problems are cropping up. Um, not as a result of that, but they cropping up everywhere. So I just don't think it's fair at this point to continue to hold them solely responsible for the delays. Okay, anybody have any questions? I just have a, a comment. Me too. Um, so so we're, they've done a better job, so that's good to hear. Mm -hmm. I saw some Rise Prep students get off a bus run by Valley Transportation Company. Now, does that mean that that the charter school sets its own contract, which we probably pay? Is that is that because Durham doesn't do the the uh, charter schools, does it? Durham does do some of the charter school runs. Um, Valley does cover for the charter schools. Valley also, from time to time, assists us. Okay, it's a cooperative effort. Valley is no longer able to provide full service to us and talking with Mr. Legary, 
they, they don't have the complement of, of buses nor drivers. Um, quite frankly, um, I wish they did. They provide, I think, better service. They're more responsive because they're here in the city, but unfortunately they don't have the capacity to support us. But that, what you witnessed is, is an occurrence that happens. Um, as a matter of fact, as recently as this week, Valley had a van out in front of this school transporting students. So they do from time to time pitch in to help. Well, they, they help out that, that Rise Prep doesn't have a contract with them that we pay for. In we listen to Durham. No, our, our contract has nothing to do with Rice Prep. Our contract with Durham only covers the school district. Okay. But we pay for their transportation in the charter schools under the, whatever contract they have. Well, we pay them tuition, and they take the tuition okay. and, and, and potentially pay the, 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 the transportation bill with the tuition that we pay okay. them. Okay, it's separate. Okay, it's not okay. All right, thank you. I'm asking too much. Um, Mr. Burke. Anybody have any other questions? Mrs. Costa. Um, so I, I don't know. I see you still kind of speaking with hesitation. I, I, I know some things are out, out of their control, but my thing is, is what is us giving them more money going to do for them? It's obviously that they've already put up a competitive wage to try to get drivers in, but us giving them more money, I don't see how that's even going to help them so, so <clears throat> i'll probably say something else that might so they enhanced their compensation to attract more candidates to fill the positions and i will say with the exception of recently where they've had a few staff members out they have kept a full complement of drivers and monitors on the bus which has historically been an issue for them that is an issue across the state it doesn't appear to be an issue for us up here right now. So, and, and, and I'm gonna, I'll defer to Mr. Perry in a second here, but I think the idea is, is they enhanced their compensation. And I think Mr. Perry would agree and I'll, I'll defer to him, but I think we're gonna either pay now or when the contract renews, they're gonna bid and we're gonna pay later. And I think they're still gonna be under what some of the competitors are gonna charge us. Um, so I think that's where we're at. And I would be remiss, again, to be fair, um, not that I want to point this, but to be fair, when this district, I did look back and research historically our transportation here in the district when I was acquainting myself when I took over facilities. And um, when this district suffered severe financial hardship, you may not be aware, but Durham carried our transportation when we could not afford to compensate them. Okay. Um, I so I that. found the memos from Mr. Fontaine, unless that's inaccurate, but I found it in writing that they, they carried us when we couldn't afford to pay them. I'm sure Dr. McGee probably recalls. And as much as I'd like to say we should not compensate them more for some of the outrageous things I've experienced and witnessed, I think in fairness to the organization, we should consider doing something because they are trying their best to hold up their end of the bargain right now. And if I felt otherwise, similar to the last two times I've spoken up, I would say place it on hold a little longer. Okay. I appreciate that. Thank you. Very good. Anything else? Mr. Vice Chair? Yes. Not to, you have me thinking with your question about charters. My understanding is we, we're responsible to provide busing to any Winsocket student to their school. So that would include Savoy, Burnin, Globe, the Catholic regional system, which we've always provided. So I would assume that would include you, charters. You're correct, Ms. Kapiskis. We, we do pay for our students to go there. Right. I was a little confused about the question. I thought you were talking about all the students. No, we, we are in charge of transporting our students to uh, the charter school. We do pay for that. You are correct. And I apologize for misunderstanding the question earlier. Unacceptable. No, I'm only playing. <laughs> Anything else? Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. McGee, roll call. Chairman Borges. Oh, 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 oh. Wait a minute. Need a motion or something? Well, no. I, I'd actually like to talk about the fiscal compensation a little bit before we, we move forward with this. Oh, sorry. I, I, I would actually like to delay this because, <laughs> quite frankly, I don't feel the school district is in a position to make a promise at this point. I, I do hear what everybody's saying, and we do want to get some money to Durham but I don't feel like we're fiscally ready to make that commitment at this point. 
I would like to wait till a little bit further into the year when we get a little more uh, so a little more solid with our fiscal projections before we begin to talk about potentially paying Durham some more money. Well, what's the total of what we're increasing to Durham? It can't be substantial. It, I mean, it's salaries, it's a couple of dollars an hour, correct? It was already in there, right? Is that the 143,000? Yeah, the 143,000. I mean, it's up to you. It's up to it's up to the committee. If you want to move forward with that full amount, that's that. This was this was what was proposed by Durham. Okay, this is what Durham proposed to us. So, I mean, I think we have a few options here. I mean, I think we can pay the whole amount if you'd like. We can pay a portion of it. Um, we can, and and I actually like to pay it out in installments as well. I don't want to pay it all now. I'd like to pay a portion of it now and then pay the rest of the end of the year. So. But if, you, if you're if you paying a portion now and a portion yeah. at the end of the year. Yeah. Are we provide, are we, are we accepting oh, their yeah. hourly increase? I think it's well, that's, the, well, these were all, again, this was all put together by Durham. So this was the ask that Durham put together that was presented to you. So. We're at the point now where, you know, do you want to pay the whole thing, the whole ask of Durham, or, or, or how, how would you like to proceed? If you're ready to proceed and pay the whole thing, we can fiscally afford it. The only thing I would ask is that we pay half now because we're at the halfway mark of the year and then pay the other half in June. That sounds, I don't know, do you have to make an amendment? If you... Well, first, somebody needs to make that motion. We don't have a motion yet. Yeah, we don't have a motion. We have a motion yet at all. <clears throat> we didn't make a motion. We have a motion. Okay. Um, so we will amend our motion. That we will will we will we will honor the the increase, but we will pay half of it now and half of it at the end of the year. Second. Oh, all Second those in favor? Do we, are we in a roll call? No, we got a roll call. Oh, Roll call for that for that Amen. amendment. Roll call for Amen. Chairman Bourget, yes. Vice Chair Burke. Yes. Mrs. Kapiskis. Yes. Mrs. Costa. Yes. Mr. Leclerc. Yes. And and on the amendment, um, I'll make a motion to accept the amendment. Second. Second, second for the Bourget. amended motion. Chairman Bourget. Yes. Vice Chair Burke. Yes. Mrs. Kapiskis. Yes. Mrs. Costa. Yes. Mr. Leclerc. Yes. Okay. All right. Everybody okay? Super. All right, we move on now. This is uh, interesting. Discussion and approval on the superintendent's recommend recommendation for the withdrawal from the Northern Rhode Island Collaborative, NRIC, in accordance with the NRIC's bylaws. Uh, motion to discuss and approve the superintendent's recommendation for the withdrawal I will make. Is there second. a second? Second by Chairman Boger. Dr. McGee. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. So. I believe that the committee has received a copy of the Northern Rhode Island Collaborative uh, bylaws. Um, I, I'm pretty sure everybody has that. So let me sort of give you a little little history um, as to you know what the collaborative is, what our um, um, our, our collaboration with them has been and where we are right now. So the Northern Rhode Island Collaborative is an organization. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a school uh, that currently is, is housed in Smithfield. And it is a, it's an alternative school that we send right now approximately 17 of our students to, uh, which sort of goes into what Mr. Uh, Perrier was talking about earlier and that part of that $6 million dollar um, light, um, not the six million dollar one. It's it's the um, the other one, the other the other line item of, of out of district students. Um, so we we have historically been a member of the collaborative, and what that means is there are uh, a number of northern Rhode Island uh, school districts, we being one of them, who both send students to the collaborative, um, and we also serve on on their on their board. Um, so the actual the, the school committees actually play a role in that and superintendents play a role in that. So for for years, when I assumed when I became superintendent, I just assumed that the, the role of going to the collaborative 
um, monthly meetings with other other superintendents, and we you know discussed the collaborative, and and, and it's it's almost it was like really a a, a school committee working with the Northern Rhode Island Collaborative. Um, about three years ago, uh, the Cumberland School Department made the decision to remove themselves from the collaborative, so they would not be members of the collaborative. Now, schools that, that are a member of the collaborative, their students that go to the collaborative that they send there, we receive a, a, um, a, a reduction in tuition. It's about $4,000. Um, that that's reduced per student that um, that is sent there. So Cumberland was the first district that removed themselves from the collaborative because at the time, the collaborative, because their enrollment numbers were not high, they were um, they were losing money. So they were in the red. So they, there was a, a, a period of time there where it was sort of touch and go whether or not they were going to continue to operate or not. Uh, their en enrollment increased over the years, and they are no longer in the red. However, uh, most recently, districts have been submitting letters to the commissioner and to the collaborative um, that they are going to be leaving the collaborative. So basically, Woonsocket, of about 12 districts that, are, that, that were members of the collaborative, we're the last standing member. Um, most recently, um, Foster Gloucester and Pawtucket have submitted their their letter saying that they're they're getting out. They're not getting out officially, however, until the end of the fiscal year. So they're still there. Um, that leaves us alone. Now, so you might say, well, that's okay. We're we're the only member there, and and they the other districts are still sending students there, but as being the only member, if they do end up going, you know, going out of business, so to speak, um, we next year, if they go out of business next year, we would be left with the liability, um, specifically the pension liability of the collaborative. Yeah, no, um, thank you. Right now, if we leave the collaborative, as the all of the other districts have, um, I believe in, in attorney Rapport might be able to speak in um, a little a little bit more detail because I, I, I think Sarah you've spoken to did you speak to to, to the collaborative or Ben Scangio about I, I can't comment on what will happen if everyone gets notice that there is no entity as of July 1st what would happen to the liability I don't have the bylaws in front of me I haven't studied them for that. <clears throat> the primary reason to give notice now is that the bylaws require six months mm -hmm. time to cross. So the deadline is December 31st. The way it looks to me from the description you've given of all the other districts withdrawing, there's going to be a total withdrawal member as of July 1st. What that means <coughs> pension liability, I can't speak to that now. It would appear from my recollection of the document that there is a process for winding down and resolving the entity that would apportion liability in some <coughs> so my hunch is that you're going to be involved in the distribution process between now and June 30th, since after June 30th, there will be no members for the last one. But the expectation is that there's going to be a recognition that it's no longer going to exist, and then whatever pension liability time, I don't know what that amount is, is um, either I don't know if it's funded or it isn't funded. I don't know the status of the funding. I haven't spoken with Mr. Spengio about that. But um, there are other collaborative institutions that have wound down and dissolved. Um, I'm thinking of the Southern Rhode Collaborative a few years ago. These are creatures of uh, status as well as the bylaws. <coughs> So, um, 
Should we choose to withdraw, which, which is my, I strongly recommend that we mm -hmm. withdraw from the collaborative, um, but should we withdraw, it wouldn't officially be until the end of the fiscal year. And the students that we currently have there would continue to be educated there through this school year. Um, I did speak with um, Mrs. Morell about our students there and the fact that we need to be proactive this second half of the school year um, in terms of finding other placements for them. Um, because what we don't want to do is, is assume that they're not going to dissolve when, when they're going to. And then we're left with students who, you know, who don't have a placement. So that's a process that we're going to start working on, you know, once the committee, um, you know, if the committee approves, you know, my, my recommendation moving forward. Chairman Boucher. Thank you, for Mr. Vice Chairman. <clears throat> you know, this legal counsel has to look over the, the bylaws, but my reading of them states that the liabilities of a collaborative will be shared equally by the participating members. So if all the other districts have issued their letter effectively leaving next June, if the collaborative declares bankruptcy within that period, then we are all participants. However, if we are the only participating uh, district after June 30th, then we would be the only participant and perhaps we would be socked with all the liabilities of the collaborative. So it makes sense for us to issue that letter and get out because if the collaborative goes down, goes under, at least whatever liabilities there are, we'd be sharing it amongst the rest of the other participating districts. That's what makes sense to me to do. It's not perhaps, Mr. Chairman. It, it, we will own all the liabilities after June 30th. Right. I just have one question, and, and, and maybe <clears throat> Mrs. Burrell can answer it. So our students that are there, we will be able to find placements for them next year if they still need it. So as I had mentioned earlier um, in my um, presentation, we're working with Bradley. Hopefully we can open up a elementary portion of a behavioral support <clears throat> that some of the students may be able to transition back with a program that we have internally. We don't have a program right now at the elementary level, hence why many of our students have gone out of district. So putting a program in at the elementary level, we would be able to bring in some students back However, we do have some outer district placements um, like high roads that we pay for 25 slots for that not all 25 slots are filled right now. So some students will be graduating. Some students have moved out of um, one socket and those spots have been open or they open up over the summer. So there are different options that we could take a look at. Um, also, the 17 students that are there, they're not just one grade level, they're from K through 12. Okay. Um, so it's easier to place some of them um, throughout. We might be able to bring some back to the middle school program that we have that is strengthening. We might be able to bring back some to the high school level. Um, it's not just one grade level that we'd be bringing them back to, um, but we would be starting now looking at some of the out of district placements mm -hmm. for the fa the fall of next year to see if we can place them there. Um, I also have started some communications with both high roads um, and I'm going to call some other out of district placements just to kind of put a bug in their ear that this might be coming um, that we work closely with. So there are other opportunities. There are, I can't say 100% there's going to be a spot for all 17, right, right. Um, but we're going to work hard to make sure that there is a spot for all 17. Um, and they're all going to be educated. So whether we have to bring them back in district and provide supports here and strengthen what we have in district, um, which it's twofold. If we bring kids back and we save money, we can take that money and strengthen our programs here. Um, however, sometimes depending on staffing, if I don't have the staff to put in front of the kids here with the certification, it's kind of twofold. Um, so myself, Kelly, and Maria will be working very diligently over the summer to make sure everyone is placed. Yeah, Dr. May, just one final point here. You did say that some of the districts that have withdrawn still have students there. They, they do. So, so even if we would withdraw, 
and the place stays in business, mm -hmm. we still, though we might pay a little bit more, mm -hmm. we can still send our students there. Is that, that a possibility? That, that's correct. So for this year, because the, um, the, 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 the timetable doesn't, doesn't start until the end of the fiscal year, all of the other districts who have already submitted their letter, their students are still there. So if we submit a letter, our students will stay there. Now, next year, yeah. let's say it you know, continues to operate. We can still send students there. We just wouldn't get the discount that being a member of the collaborative would afford us. But we remove our liability potential. Right, that's correct. Right. Um, I think Mr. Perry had <laughs> something to say. It was a, it was a, we're looking at about a $4,000 increase, I believe in the tuition cost as a non-member versus a member. So that's really the, that's the difference that you'd be looking at. If the collaborative continues going into next year, you're looking at $4,000 or more times 18 students. That's, is that the correct count we got there? 17. I apologize. Ms. Awesome. What's that number? I, I'm not good at math, sir. <laughs> Really? You're, you're, you're looking at about, uh, yeah, yeah, 70,000. Quite the mm -hmm. contrary. <laughs> Mr. Vice Chair? Yes, Mr. Kapiskis. I did look at the bylaws, and the bylaws section two provides that if a member withdraws, the withdrawing member is still responsible to make payments to the collaborative for its fair share of the liabilities incurred or increased while a member. So we're still on the hook for anything through June 30th. Yeah, but not for the whole. Right. But so is Pawtucket. So is yeah. whatever else it might be. Right. I think um, then it talks about part B, the liabilities. If the Northern Northern Renown Collaborative dissolves, all liabilities incurred by the collaborative will be paid by the participating members based on established procedures. I read these bylaws through. There's nothing that defines what participating members are. Uh, which is why we're going to get sued, but that doesn't mean that the collaborative will necessarily be successful mm -hmm. in suing us. Um, on top of which, my big concern is, one of my big concerns, is if they go forward, all of its governance talks about a five-person quorum of participating members, and they're not going to have, they're not going to be able to meet that quorum. They're going to have to change their governance completely, which means that at that point, they may have to look at the bylaws for liabilities too. So it's really up in the air. And I think the best thing we do to protect ourselves is withdraw now and plan not to participate mm -hmm. in the future. I think that's really all we can do. I agree. Okay. That was me taking my little, pointing my lawyer hat on. I'm going to take it off for a minute. Okay. <laughs> and the other we love comments? when you put your lawyer hat on. Any other comments? And we all set. And there is a motion. I'll make the motion. Huh? Oh, it's done. A roll call vote, yes. Roll call. Chairman Bourget, yes. Vice Chair Burke, yes. Mrs. Kapiskis, yes. Mrs. Costa, yes. Mr. LeClaire, yes. Thank you. Next item discussion and approval on the group work camps rental requests for the Hamlet Middle School. Uh, I'll make the motion to discuss and approve. Doc, uh, Chairman Bourget seconds. Uh, Dr. McGee, Chairman Bourget. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, the work camps. Oh, okay. is, it, is it the same as last year? It, it, it is the same. Same yeah, contract, same, same problem. Yeah, it's the same. It's the same group. All right, so let's roll call. Yeah, no, no change. <laughs> no discussion. We have, a pro have we had a problem with them in prior years ever? No, I we have not. So. No. Okay. Roll, roll call. call vote. Chairman Bourget. Yes. Vice Chair Burke. Yes. Mrs. Kapiskis. Yes. Mrs. Costa. Yes. Mr. Leclerc. Yes. Okay, thank you. We are now going to move on to the discussion and approval on an addendum to the Winsocket High School Handbook, specifically to the honor roll, highest honors, and class rank section. Um, I'll make a motion to discuss and approve the addendum to Second. the Winsocket High School's handbook, specifically the honor roll, highest honors, and class rank section. And uh, second, Mrs. Costa. Ms. Kapiskas, I believe you spoke about this earlier? Yes, I did. It's simply to provide the bump up in the grade, the 10 bonus points, um, treating the any um, dual enrollment and concurrent enrollment college classes um, as an AP class for weight and determining a student's academic average. It affects two sections of the handbook. I provided everybody with a copy of the original language and the copy of the proposed change to the language and the proposed changes were provided to Dr. McGee and met his approval. Um, he was also present at the policy meeting when we discussed this. And I do recommend that we approve it. 
Any other comments? Okay, Dr. McGee, roll call. Chairman Bourget? Yes. Vice Chair Burke? Yes. Mrs. Kapiskas? Yes. Mrs. Costa? Yes. Mr. LeClaire? Yes. Excellent. Um, we get 15 minutes. All right. Discussion now <laughs> on approval of an amendment to the Special Education Local Advisory Committee. I'll make a motion to approve. Second? Second. Second by Chairman Bourget. Mrs. Kapiskas? Um, as the acting chair of the CELAC, um, I was reviewing the bylaws um, because I was on the school committee at the time these most recent bylaws were executed and I was not then the chair. Um, and now I'm back to being acting chair. And it, it, I never realized that the requirements for the chair do not require that the chair has a child in district with an IEP, uh, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. It seems to me that the chair of the CELAC should be a parent or a guardian of a child with an IEP. It doesn't make sense for it to just be anybody. Uh, so the proposed change is to include that language and the language is the chairperson shall be the parent or guardian of a student with an IEP attending a public school in the city of Woonsocket, which shall be under the auspices of the WED, which means our public schools, not a charter, not a Catholic regional. Um, if the student of the current chairperson shall graduate or otherwise exit said school, the chairperson may continue to serve in the capacity of acting chair until such time as a suitable replacement has been found and installed, which is the situation I'm in now, which is why I'm currently sitting as the acting chair, even though I no longer have a child in district with an IEP, because a suitable replacement has not stepped up or been volunteered yet. Um, so as a result, I, I do suggest that we adopt this change so that whoever it is coming in will meet that requirement because it just makes common sense. Can, can we amend that to make Lynn Kapiskas the permanent chair? <laughs> There's this little thing called the 13th Amendment. I would second <laughs> that. Worth a shot. <laughs> Look at Lynch. <laughs> I'm gonna stop throwing mints at you. <laughs> so, so Lynn, th there's not very many parents that attend our meetings as it is. No. And do you know who the next person with a, a person? Uh, it would be me. I know Ms. Morales. I have Mr. I have a kid on the in the school system with an IEP. But you and I have the same problem. We We're should both not on, be. I yeah. should not be liaison and acting chair. You cannot be liaison. You cannot be a school committee member and chair because there's too much potential for conflict. That's what I was told in the past. I don't know if Will and Corinthy feels differently now, but I was told I should not be acting as chair. But I really have no choice because there is nobody else. And after 17 years, I'm not going to let this thing fold. Yeah. Just because of that little technicality, I'll take my chances. Um, but the next person should not be connected to the school committee. Right. Because there should be a separate freestanding school committee member who's a liaison, which is also the position I serve. Um, it, it's working for now because there's not a lot of tremendous conflicts. Things are going pretty smoothly, which is why our meetings are not well attended. That's my position. It's always been my position. When CELAC's not well attended, it means things are going well. When CELAC's well attended, it means there's a lot of people with problems that are there to complain. Yeah. That's just the general rule. Um, they're trying to find. Yes, mm -hmm. that's right. They're trying to find, I know they're actively trying to find and have been actively trying to find since I was elected to the school committee four years ago, someone to take my place. I had someone briefly. She lasted about six months. And quite frankly, she wouldn't qualify right now, even if she were willing to come back, because she no longer has a child in district. And that's the thing. If we, if we make that change, it already is hard enough for us to find somebody to do it now, let alone somebody that's going to have a child in the school system. But why would we want to have somebody acting as chair who knows nothing? No, about you don't. Special education? You don't. You've got to have somebody who actually, it would be better served to have somebody unlike me who has a child in district and is going through evaluations and, <coughs> IEPs and seeing whether or not they're getting a select brochure or when they have a meeting with an LEA. I don't know any of that because I no longer have a child in district. My son, in fact, is graduating from CCRI. So he's well out of the district. See, my daughter's point. in third grade, and she's going through IEPs right now. So so I think that the district would be better served, that the CELAC would be better served to have a parent of a child with special needs. It just it just makes more sense, and it, it should have always been that way, in it my does. opinion. And I can tell you, before me, the parent before me was a parent of a child with an IEP, and she left because her child had a speech-only IEP, 
And when her daughter entered fourth grade, she lost her speech only IEP and she could no longer chair, which is how, although I had, my son had been in school for about three months, I ended up taking over as chair of the CELOC because I was the only person who got volunteered. And here I still sit. That's because we love you, Lynn. No. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Okay. We're, we're running, up yeah, against, we're running time against time here. here. Yep. Okay. So, um, Dr. McGee, roll call on the amendments. Chairman Bourget. Yes. Vice Chair Burke. Yes. Mrs. Kapiskas. Yes. Mrs. Costa. Yes. Mr. LeClaire. Yes. Okay. Before I make a motion to adjourn, I still have the mic. Uh, first, I want to say, since this is our first meeting of our new terms, I want to say welcome and congratulations uh, to the members as we begin our, our second, uh, our, our two year term. And also, I will say on behalf of the committee, happy holidays to everybody. Happy New Year. Stay well, stay warm, and we shall see you next year. I will now make a motion to adjourn at 951. Second, Second by Mrs. Costa. Do I have uh, all those in favor say aye? Aye. aye. aye.